Talofalava, my name is Annie. I am a researcher here at the Scientific Research Organization of Samoa, and I'm happy to share a little bit about what we're working on that relates to ABS work. So at the moment, um, SROS, or our organization, are looking into bioactivity of our local resources, namely plant resources, that relate to the biomedicinal aspects of our traditional knowledge. Um, because our communities have long held traditional knowledge, um, but we have never known the scientific backing or we've never had the scientific data to prove exactly how these resources work for our people. So that's what we're doing at the moment. For example, we have some leaves here that we're currently analyzing their chemical composition or their bioactivity to support how they work when our uh, traditional healers use them on our people. And we're also happy to say that our local ministry, our Ministry of Natural Environments, have put into place legislations that support the Nagoya Protocols. Um, and we're also happy to use these leg legislations that when we go out to co our communities, because we feel that it's only fair that we, that our communities get rewarded for their, not only for providing the natural resources, but also for providing their knowledge or sharing their knowledge. So we like going out with these legislations because we feel that we're not exploiting their knowledge and resources and vice versa. So they also feel the same knowing we're coming with the government backing under these legislations. Going forward, as our discussions progress under a post-2020 uh, diversity, we're hoping other issues that um, small research organizations like us are facing, for example, taking um, our genetic resources overseas for further analysis, as we have limited capacity to do it on site. So we're hoping in the event we do have to take it overseas that our resources are protected, findings are protected, and any outcomes of it or rewards come back to our people and is shared like amongst our government and our communities. So thank you very much for this opportunity. We wish everyone the best as uh, for the rest of the conference and thank you very much. Коллеги и друзья, от себя лично и от имени Республики Беларусь хочу поздравить нас всех с первым юбилеем Нагойского протокола. Нагойский протокол – это важный механизм, который позволяет нам добиться реализации глобальной цели по сохранению и устойчивому использованию биологического разнообразия. Биоразнообразие – это не только основа жизни на Земле, но и источник средств для существования и благополучия людей. Поэтому выгоды от использования биологического разнообразия должны распределяться на справедливой основе. Наша страна в самом начале этого пути. Мы стремимся использовать знания и опыт других стран для создания национального механизма регулирования доступа к традиционным знаниям и связанным с ними генетическими ресурсами. Мы приняли вызов и готовы двигаться к намеченной цели. Поэтому мне очень приятно, что нам выпала честь поделиться нашим скромным опытом взаимодействия национального компетентного органа и исследователей Беларуси для обеспечения легального доступа к генетическим ресурсам. Я уверена, что объединяя наши усилия, мы можем достичь больших успехов с десятилетием благополучия, процветания, справедливости. Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Welcome to this session, the second session of the uh, Global ABS Conference 2020. Uh, this session is ABS for Users 1, a dialogue between governments and researchers. Um, and we are starting the session for uh, Asia Pacific and the CIS uh, countries. Let me give you some um, logistics of the session. So the protocol for participants. The first one is that this session is being recorded and will be available through the Global ABS community, the community of practice of the UNDPGF Global ABS project. During this session, participants' uh, microphones will be muted, but will be able to ask questions through the Q&A functionality available at the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen. Participants' questions will be addressed after the panelists' presentations during the Q&A uh, section as a schedule. And to continue the discussions on the topic of this webinar, of this session, please visit the Global ABS community and leave your discussion on the forum section. Um, the agenda for today's session 
is that we will have some welcome remarks and presentations of the objectives of the webinar. Uh, then we will uh, have a short presentation of the AID system under the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocol. Please check we will hear from, from different uh, countries, from the Asia Pacific and CIS uh, countries, from national competent authorities and researchers. We have a, a panel uh, focusing on the experience of uh, Belarus, India, and, and the activity in the Pacific. And we will have a presentation from uh, the user compliance measures perspective, uh, the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol in the European Union. And in the second part of this uh, session, we will move into emerging issues or issues that uh, need to be addressed in the realm of ABS. Uh, in particular, we will uh, tackle the issue of digital sequence information uh, with a panel of different colleagues that will guide us through the key questions on uh, DSI and also on the issue of pathogens and health emergencies. We will, the last intervention in the, in the panel, in the session, will be on the next step, next steps, how to interact on the international process on digital sequence information, but also the process of the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework negotiations. And of course, we will have a short uh, session of uh, Q&A and a debate towards the, the end. So as you can see in the screen, we had uh, a long list of panelists uh, for this morning. Um, so it could be very important that we are all uh, on track regarding the time. I will give some indications for that. But let me again uh, welcome you all, the participants of the panelists to this uh, second session of the Global Conference on Access to Genetic Resources and the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits derived from their utilization, commonly known as uh, ABS. The Global ABS Conference is co-organized by the UNDP EGF Global ABS Project and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, in collaboration with the governments of Japan and Jordan and other institutions. Last Thursday, October 29th, marked the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the Nagoya Protocol. A perfect excuse to celebrate this instrument, take a stock of the progress made in the last years of implementation, but more importantly, to identify the issues that need to be addressed and adjusted and take advantage of the unique opportunity that the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework negotiations brings to all of us. In that sense, today, we initiate the substantive part of the Global ABS Conference with the first out of three dialogues that we have prepared between governments and researchers. The following Wednesdays, we will have a dialogue with private sector and a dialogue with indigenous peoples and local communities. We believe the mobilization of researchers into ABS is so crucial that we have decided to approach this session for researchers through three regional sessions. In that sense, I would like to indicate that this session has interpretation into Russian. And this is very important that you keep in mind uh, that when you have interpretation, we all need to speak uh, as low uh, in order to make clear our points and also to allow the interpreters to uh, translate, okay? 
the idea with this session is not to go in depth and find the solution to all the issues. I wish we could have a magical one to do that, but to initiate But this is just to initiate a dialogue on these important issues, a dialogue between governments and researchers that should continue at the appropriate national and regional levels in preparation for the post-2020 biodiversity negotiations. As I have indicated before, we have a long list of panelists and therefore I take this opportunity to insist on the importance of making short interventions, speakers only, keep to the plan in order to properly hear from each other and also have some time towards the end for some questions and answers and uh, some debate. I will start applying that concrete approach with a very short introduction. But we would like to invite all the attendees to check the short bios of the panelists in the website of the conference at conference2020.abs-sustainabledevelopment.net. We will hear from three ABS experiences from the region and then from other colleagues on ABS uh, emerging issues or issues that need our attention. But before giving them the floor, I would like to hear from Mr. Taokondo Senshi Kongo, who is the ABS Senior Program Manager at the Convention on Biological Diversity, who is going to make a short presentation of the ABS system under the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocol. Mr. Shikongo is very experienced on ABS and international negotiations as he served as Africa's chief negotiator for the negotiation of the Nagoya Protocol in 2010. And he was actually the co-chair of the small group on compliance. Chao Kondo, thank you for being with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro, and uh, good morning to all colleagues that are here with us this morning or evening, wherever we are on this planet, under these very interesting, challenging circumstances of COVID-19. May we all be well and safe. Um, today, we're looking at the WEA protocol on access and benefit sharing and the issues around that. And we focusing on the ABS we all need, and we're asking ourselves what do providers want and what do the researchers want? And it's control over their own genetic resources, as well as assurance that benefits will be shared after access is granted. Whereas researchers want to have a fair and non-arbitrary rules and procedures for pick and mat, as well as realistic timelines. Next. Next. Um, and by working together, uh, ABS can be achieved. And we are using here an analog of a soccer team when all players in one team are working together, then we can achieve what we would like to achieve. And so the Nagoya Protocol provides a framework to help countries address the concerns of both users and providers as we have just seen in the previous slide. And next, we are going to have a small uh, um, video that is just going to outline the ABS system as it is currently operating. And it's developed with the ABS initiative together. Many products in food, cosmetics, biotech, and medicines, as well as advances in science, are based on genetic resources. Already in 1992, the CBD had established access and benefit sharing principles, which includes the obligation for users of genetic resources to share benefits with providers of those resources. However, one challenge remained. 
to ensure benefit sharing once the user has left the provider country with the genetic resource. There was no international system that allowed the provider to keep track of what was happening with their resource abroad. With the Nagoya Protocol, which entered into force in 2014, this changed. The ABS Clearinghouse was established as the central hub to facilitate the necessary communication and information exchange between users, providers, and governments. The ABS Clearinghouse facilitates the monitoring of the utilization of a genetic resource once it leaves the provider country. The Nagoya Protocol sets up a system to inform the provider country on milestones related to the utilization of genetic resources abroad. However, to make this system work, every country needs to take action at the national level. Therefore, a country must establish at least one competent national authority, or CNA for short. The CNA issues a permit to grant access to genetic resources in accordance with domestic regulations. Key information from the permit must be transferred to the ABS Clearinghouse. The submitted information now constitutes the internationally recognized Certificate of Compliance. Now, let's turn our attention to a user. After possibly many years of laboratory work, she has succeeded in research and development and now puts a product on the market. With her certificate and the required documentation, she goes to the authority for market approval in her country. This authority, since it has been designated to act as checkpoint in the ABS process, sends a message called a checkpoint communique to the ABS clearinghouse. The ABS Clearinghouse, having received the checkpoint communique, automatically informs the CNA in the provider country. This allows the competent national authority to compare the communique with the initial permit, domestic legislation, and with the contract documents. Action can now be taken by the CNA if the utilization was not in accordance with the initial agreement. Certainty for all parties is ensured through this process, no matter how much time has passed. Let's take a closer look at the key elements of this global system for monitoring the utilization of genetic resources. The CNA in a country is responsible for issuing a permit when access requirements are met and benefit sharing is agreed. When the information from the permit issued by the CNA is registered on the ABS Clearinghouse, it becomes the Internationally Recognized Certificate of Compliance, the central document to ensure legal certainty in the user country. The ABS Clearinghouse facilitates the exchange and flow of information with respect to the utilization of genetic resources. Furthermore, Countries that have ratified the Nagoya Protocol are obliged to share information on their national ABS procedures in the ABS Clearinghouse. This information helps users to understand the particular ABS requirements of a given country. Checkpoints gather information from users on when and how genetic resources are being utilized in order to report back to the ABS Clearinghouse and thus inform the provider. Typical checkpoints are patent offices, funding institutions, publishers, market approval authorities, and other institutions dealing with innovation, product development, and commercialization. The checkpoint communique is a standard form for compiling the information gathered by the checkpoint in order to make it available to the ABS clearinghouse and forward it to the provider. All countries have to put all these elements in place. Only when these elements are operating effectively will monitoring the use of genetic resources between countries be possible. This will contribute to increasing transparency and trust and result in more ABS agreements and partnerships, which in turn translate into advances in science, more innovation, products, and benefit sharing for users, providers, and the conservation of nature.
So um, we have seen how the system work and uh, the entire system is designed for us to reach the goal, which is users and providers, researchers and governments all have the same goal, conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. And ABS is thus meant to be for the benefit of all. Next slide. Next slide. And um, Article 8 of the, of the protocol has got special considerations. And these special considerations were included in the protocol with this goal in mind. Playing soccer, sometimes teams have to ready to be ready to play under special conditions, be it snow, be it rain, or over enthusiastic fans. And it is the same for ABS. Article 8 requires, therefore, countries to implement measures to address access for special considerations. For instance, 8A, to expedite access and encourage non-commercial research. 8B, to handle sharing of pathogens and health emergencies through expedite access and expedite the benefit sharing, including affordable treatment. And 8C, to address issues of food security. Next slide. Next slide. Um, with any system, there are uh, generally complaints. And what is the common, most common complaint from users of genetic resources? We, the Secretary runs the help desk to help users of the ABS Clearinghouse to use its functionality or answer questions related to the implementation of the protocol by email. And it is abcha at cbd.nt or a live chat on that website. Most visitors to the clearinghouse are users, which comprise 60% of uh, the visitors. And many of the people contacting the help desk are users. Most have the same question or complaint. And these uh, complaints are in the next slide. Um, how can I legally access a genetic resource? The information I need is not available on the ABS clearing house mechanism, or the national focal point is not responding to my request. Procedures for access are not clear. So we, we provide a proactive outreach to parties to facilitate updating and publishing of national information. And the main reason information is not available is because many national ABS systems are not fully in place as uh, adopting and operationalizing measures take time and effort. Next slide. Now, ABS uh, Clearing House Mechanism is about information sharing and communication. The Clearing House is the official place to communicate and share information about ABS, and parties have obligations to share and keep up to date national information if information is not available. It does not mean there are no ABS rules in place. The national focal points are responsible for sharing information on the country's ABS system. Unofficial communication and cooperation also play a big role in ABS. Users can share information on the moral contractual clauses, codes of conduct, guidelines, and best practices that they have developed. Or users can help improve the ABS clearing hours by providing the feedback to the Secretariat. Next slide. The ABS uh, mechanism has uh, the ABS uh, procedures that we developed. And these are step-by-step -step guides uh, that countries can share uh, on the ABS clearinghouse to help guide us use or use us through the various rules and procedures for access. If you look at the slides there, once you know the rules, you can play the game and you can actually then reach the goal. So countries can be specify different procedures based on different types of users, types of genetic resources, types of uh, the different use that you're going to use. And uh, the ABS procedures provide answers on to whom do I submit my application? How long will it take? What are the prerequisites? What documents are needed? And is there a fee? Um, next slide. So we have the uh, 
internationally recognized uh, certificate of compliance, and it serves two main purposes. The first one is to serve as evidence of compliance as users encounter the various checkpoints, as we have seen in the short movie, and it is to facilitate information on utilization is uh, shared with the provider without giving away any confidential information. Um, the steps there is that uh, CNA issue a permit to the user, the, uh, the, the CNA or National Focal Point submit certain non-confidential info from permit to the clearinghouse to create the certificate. Users receive copy of the certificate from, and then users encounter checkpoint while using the genetic resource outside of the provider country. And users will then present the certificate to facilitate the action with checkpoint. The checkpoint sent information collected from the user to the uh, clearinghouse mechanism, and the clearinghouse mechanism informs provider of checkpoint interaction from user. You have the final slide. So when it does come to ABS, we are all on the same team, and that is the team uh, Nagoya. And as we said, once all the players are doing the right thing for the right reasons, we can then all celebrate in the end as the ABS we all want. Thank you. Thank you so much for setting the ABS a scene, which, is, which allows us to move into national experience in the region. First in our list is Belarus, one of the first and few countries in the CIS region that have established an ABS regime at the national level. We have with us uh, Ms. Tatiana Selesnova, who is the advisor of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environmental Protection of uh, Belarus. Um, Tatiana, what are the key features of the ABS yeah. system in Belarus, in particular in regard to research? Я прошу прощения, этапы. Я не слышу переводчика. Great, Tatiana, we can see you and we can hear you perfectly. Спасибо. Какие этапы? Просто схему просто расскажи. А я так понимаю, что надо Татьяна. I was indicating that Belarus is one of the few countries in the CIS region with an AV system in place. Could you explain us the features of the AV system in Belarus, in particular uh, for researchers? Да, конечно. Спасибо большое за такую возможность предоставленную. Я хочу сказать, что на сегодняшний день уже у нас в стране создан определен национальный компетентный орган, которым является Министерство природных ресурсов. Также определен национальный координационный центр, который является также контрольным пунктом мониторинга. Они функционируют на базе Института генетики и цитологии Национальной академии наук. И с учетом того опыта, который у нас на сегодняшний день имеется, а это в частности 8 передач, которые мы уже на сегодняшний день осуществили, порядок у нас следующий. Любое заинтересованное лицо может обратиться, это либо поставщик, либо пользователь, может обратиться в Национальный коррекционный центр для того, чтобы ему, им, вернее, помогли составить договор на доступ к генетическим ресурсам. Национальный центр помогает в оформлении такого договора и значит, направляет вот эту заявку о доступе к генетическим ресурсам в компетентный национальный орган, то есть к нам. Мы, в свою очередь, наша основная задача – проверить, 
чтобы в этом договоре, который заключен между поставщиком и пользователем, были отражены все положения Нагойского протокола. Вот на основании, скажем так, имеющегося опыта, и на сегодняшний день, вернее, мы используем положение Нагойского протокола, но в то же время, благодаря, скажем так, проекту, который у нас был в 2018-2019 году, мы смогли изучить опыт других стран, и на сегодняшний день у нас уже, скажем так, есть определенный механизм, который мы хотим воплотить в нашем национальном уже законодательстве. И, значит, мы определили, как у нас будет проходить вот этот вот механизм и на что он будет распространяться. Значит, механизм я вам уже описала, как у нас происходит доступ к генетическим ресурсам, а сферу действия закона у нас будет распространяться на диких животных, на домашних культивируемых видов растений и животных, которые обитают в, в естественной среде и специально созданным человеком условиях. Ну вот на сегодняшний день у нас такая процедура. Но в то же время хочу сказать, что на 2021 год в нашей стране уже указом президента одобрен проект законопроектов, в котором будет разрабатываться концепция закона об обращении с генетическими ресурсами. И вот в рамках этого закона, вот этот механизм, который я вам озвучила, он будет, в принципе, отражен. Вот, спасибо. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana, and thank you for introducing us also the incoming no, changes and new legislation that will be uh, implementing next year, 21, right? We also have from Belarus, in this case from the research community, uh, Ms. Tatiana uh, Limpinskaya, who is the leading research scientist at the Scientific and Practical Center of the National Academy of Science of Belarus on your resources. Tatiana, what kind of projects are you conducting at the moment? And what is your experience in regard to the ABS system in Belarus? Thank you, Alejandra. Yes, on today's day, my research interest is in the fact that we are studying invasion processes in global scale in the territory of Belarus. Кроме того, нами проводится работа по составлению референсных библиотек ДНК последовательностей, как в регионах, так и в индикаторных видах водных беспозвоночных. В 2018 году совместно с коллегами из университета Атага мы запустили пилотный проект по мониторингу чужеродных видов водных беспозвоночных в реках Беларуси с помощью так называемой environmental ДНК, ну или как на русском называют ее средовая ДНК. И метабаркотинга. Для достижения цели проекта были отобраны пробы environmental ДНК на разных участках рек и отправлены коллегам в Новую Зеландию для анализа. Для того, чтобы соблюсти все требования Нагойского протокола, мы обратились в национальный координационный центр по за помощью подготовки необходимых документов. Получив образец, стандартного соглашения по передаче генетических ресурсов и совместному использованию выгод, мы вместе с получателем университета Матага согласовали тест и подписали соглашение. После чего Национальный координационный центр взял на себя всю переписку для получения необходимых разрешений от Министерства природных ресурсов и охраны окружающей среды. Я хочу обратить, отметить следующее, что весь процесс у нас занял около трех недель, причем две недели пришло на согласование текста соглашения и его подписание между поставщиком получанием и получателем генресурсов. Разрешение министерства было получено оперативно в течение семи дней. Подытожив, это был наш первый опыт, но очень позитивный. 
опыт работы с соблюдением всех требований Новойского протокола. Радует то, что несмотря на всю сложность самого протокола с позиции ученого, ученого данный процесс не требует много времени э, и сил для получения всех необходимых документов и не затрудняет работу. Хочется обратить внимание, что работа нашего национального кондиционного центра поставлена на высоком уровне, а сам кондиционный центр является ключевым, связующим звеном между ученым и министерством. Все, у меня все. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you for introducing in this first round the key features and your experience about the ABS system in, in Belarus. I, I will come back to you, okay? Uh, we have all the panelists from other countries, but don't, don't leave as we are going to have other interventions and I will also ask you other questions, okay? Thank you. So next in our list is uh, India, uh, the country with the highest number by far of internationally recognized certificates of compliance registered at the ABS uh, Clearing House. We have the honor of having with us uh, today uh, Dr. Uh, Mathur, who is the chairperson of the National Biodiversity Authority in India. Um, before this position, uh, Mr. Dr. Mathur served as the director of the Wildlife Institute of India between the year 2014 and the year 2019. And we also have from the research uh, sector, Dr. Bala Prasad, who is currently engaged as UNDP India consultant and chair of the working group on seed uh, systems of uh, revitalizing rain-fed areas network in India and the Odisha and Millet mission and former director of the uh, ECRR Institute, Indian Institute of Oil Seeds Research. I would like to hear from both of you um, on the key features of the ABS system in India um, and how this system promotes uh, research in your, in your view. Um, and also what is the experience uh, and the feedback of the research uh, sector. So please, uh, Dr. Mathur and Dr. Bar Prasad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandro. Can you see my screen, please? Yes, and we can hear you loud and clear. If you can turn your camera on, that would be nice too. Both of you, please. Okay. Let us me one second. One second. I... Do we need to turn our camera or it's regulated at your end? Uh, I think you should be able at the bottom of your screen, you should have the option of turning on your camera. Okay. Ah, uh, now it's on, yes. We can see you now, Dr. Okay. Mathur. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So thank you Go for ahead, providing please. this uh, valuable approach valuable opportunity. Uh, what I and my colleague, uh, Dr. Prashad are going to do is to share some of our experience uh, on the research and innovation as they pertain to ABS. And I would definitely say that no activity can be conducted or managed or monitored without a very effective and efficient regulatory process. And that is what India has done, that uh, way back in 2002, we enacted our Biological Diversity Act. We framed the rules under that. And uh, in 2014, we prepared our access and benefit sharing guidelines. And all of these are available on our website. But what I want to say is that when we talk of regulation, obviously the regulation is in respect of many things, but for our dialogue today on research and innovation. So obviously access to research is very important. 
but we try to distinguish it also for research purposes and for commercial utilization. So we have different uh, set of rules, the playing rules. If you are going in for commercial utilization, then there are some additional requirements that need to be fulfilled. Similarly, what happens in research, there could be a requirement of transferring of research results. So we are trying to make the process very simple. And at the same time, a researcher also needs to obtain the intellectual property rights based on his or her work. So what are the rules and regulations for that? We have working with the India Patent Office, build up a set of rules for that. And sometimes it happens that while you are conducting your research, you would need to transfer your biological resources from one lab to the other and so on and so forth. So these rules have been notified. These are under implementation and uh, the scientific community uh, is using them. I will come back to it that they do feel some difficulties in implementing them. But the interesting part is that there are certain exemptions. For example, if we have an international collaborative project with Russia or with Poland or with Belarus or with anybody which has been approved by the government of the two respective countries, then those research projects are free from these research requirements which are there. Similarly, when you want to do some experiments on breeding, on training, on um, accessions of materials of uh, ITPGFRA, then also these rules are simplified and no um, permission from NBA is needed. Same thing happens when we publish seminar and research workshops papers, then also the exemptions are there. And as I said that uh, if I as a researcher want to carry the biological material for non-commercial purposes or sometimes for emergency purposes. See, all of us know the recent COVID-19 situation. We, were, uh, uh, we made an amendment in our processes and we granted permission for any experiment or use of biological resources for development of COVID-19 treatment. So in flat five days time, on the day that we received and within five days, actually it was three days, we were able to grant approvals from the NBA, which can take place um, four weeks or 10 weeks or so on. So in certain emergency situations, we can uh, improvise and we have done it. And um, those things are also very important for our research community to know that if there are some exceptional circumstances, these can be expedited as well. The point I want to make, which was uh, being discussed earlier by our colleagues, that uh, India has now embarked on what we call as a digital India process. We have uh, a philosophy of becoming self-reliant and promoting what we call as ease of doing business. So this ease of doing business is not only for the businessmen or the corporates, but these are also for the research community. So what we have done, we have now developed an online portal. This portal, as you can see, these slides will be available, can be accessed anywhere, and it provides a large number of facilities. It has a very user-friendly architecture to begin with. Tutorials on videos are provided. A help desk is provided. And on a real-time basis, uh, any researcher or any person who is involved in the ABS process can track the fate of his or her application. So this is something which we would like to encourage and share our experience with the rest of the world, particularly in the mega diverse countries and in the developing world, that this portal, which India has made a beginning, we did it under a, a GIZ project, and there are some fine tunings to be done, but this is the way out as we look at the ABS process uh, in times to come. Recently, as I said, our legal instruments came into being in 2002. And in the last 18 years, we have had our own experience of implementing them. There are problems there, there are issues there, there are concerns over there of all the communities, all our stakeholders. And now in a very elaborate process, 
we are amending or in the process of amending these legal instruments. And these also include the access and benefit sharing guidelines that we developed in 2014. These guidelines are again being revised and revisited in 2020. And I think by the end of the year, we should be able to notify them. These will be available on our website and countries can find some aspects of it useful uh, as they develop their own legal instruments or legislations on that. And lastly, before I end, uh, our experience has been that no matter what we talk about ABS, many people, many stakeholders still feel that the ABS is like a tax. And that perception needs to change. So we are now trying to go back and change the discourse or change the philosophy of the discourse and to come up with an idea that ABS can also be a process of incentivization. So the companies, we are right now conducting a study dealing with the cosmetic sector that because cosmetic sector has a huge export potential in the North American and the European markets. So we are thinking that if a company is reliant or compliant on the ABS, it can be rewarded and awarded a kind of a logo which says that this company is uh, this uh, uh, company is compliant. And obviously, we do have the IRCC process. It is not a substitute for that, but it goes beyond that. So the reputation of the company increases, and hopefully, as we go along, we should be able to brand these companies. And if our experience is positive on the cosmetic sector, we might expand it to other sectors. So I will stop here and I would request my colleague, uh, Dr. Vara Prashad, to come up with a very practical way in which uh, research and access and benefit sharing interface has been developed to share his very valuable experience. So over to you, Dr. Vara Prashad, from here on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Thank you, Dr. Alejandro, for this opportunity. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, this is in brief uh, the process uh, that we undergo in India uh, for uh, ABS purpose. These are the providers or the communities or the biodiversity monitoring committees. The NBA has uh, facilitated more than 265,000 uh, communities recognized as BMCs. And we take the bio resource. An Indian doing research in India does not require prior approval from the national competent national authority. We take the bio resource, we take it to research, and we uh, maybe in a matter of uh, five to 10 years, a technology will be developed out of that. And that will be licensed to the industry. And after licensing to the industry, even out of the license fee through State Biodiversity Board or NBA, that is national, national competent national authority, uh, if it is uh, foreign nationals are involved, national biodiversity authority, if it is local state biodiversity authority, this license fee is also partly shared with the communities. Then if it is to be industry when it comes, we'll have an agreement with them, a memorandum of agreement or understanding. Then a temporary, this is the checkpoint that CIB, Central Insecticide Board, will give approval for the marketing of the product. Biopesticides is the example I'm taking here in this case. And when they give the approval, biosafety and toxicity data is developed and a permanent approval is accorded by the Central Insecticide Board, and the industry is now ready to market it. When they market it, at that, uh, uh, even at the first point and second point, they will have a memorandum of agreement, uh, either with the State Biodiversity Board or NBA, as the case may be. And the uh, user institute, like our research institute, will also have uh, agreement with the NBA, and they will facilitate with the industry. And finally, the benefit will flow from the uh, marketed uh, produce to the provider through SBB or NBA. This is in brief. We have the experience in case of Bacillus thuringiensis and Trichoderma, and also in case of Bavaria bassiana. And uh, ICR has done more than, uh, next slide please, more than 22 biopesticides, uh, which are now ready for about to market. Yeah, the just research cycle to tell you, we get the bio resource from the communities, make it culture it, and out of that culture, we test the uh, selected cultures for efficacy in the greenhouse or in the laboratory and in the controlled conditions. Then also in the field, 
so that it is very effective. And then it uh, is uh, a technology is developed to make it uh, available to the farmers. And uh, there will be also commercial scale uh, uh, culturing is done. This is the research cycle. Next slide, please. Uh, in the next slide, we have I have just given few examples where the biopesticides that this our institute, Indian Institute of Oil Seed Research, has uh, uh, developed and they are now available in the market with different brand names. These are all the brand names, and uh, this is the commercial scale production tested at the research institute. And we will have an MOU with the industry, of course, uh, along with the NBA or SBB, National Biodiversity Board, RTS State Biodiversity Board, as it as it is applicable. For marketing. Next slide, please. And we have realized that uh, the importance of uh, capacity building in the research institutes is extremely important. This project has given us uh, an extremely good opportunity, and uh, more than 200 uh, uh, key scientists in the research institutes are trained, and some master trainees are also developed. In every capacity building, the beauty is the national um, focal point chairman, Dr. Mathuri, is uh, directly addressing the participants. So that link is very well built. Then we have also developed the three, three products in this project, a handbook of ABS and ethical code of conduct at the institute level and monitoring guidelines at the institute level. These are just for the drafts for approval after final finalization of the guidelines, revised guidelines. These will be put on the NBA website and also in ICR website so that anybody can see and know the procedures for the ABS. And already, as uh, Dr. Mathur has said, uh, no need to apply physically, electronically it can be applied. And we have also contacted all the directors of the institutes for, uh, and also NARM, a key institute for training. We are now institutionalizing the ABS into the research sector. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alejandro, for the opportunity. That's all I would like to Thank share. Thank you very Next much to, to both of you, Dr. Mathur and Dr. Balaprasad. Uh, for introducing us the key features of the ABS system in India, a country with a wealth of experience, um, as it was explained. And, and I think you highlighted key features no, of the um, ABS that we all need already. Um, so relevance of the online system, we are talking about information. Uh, if we want ABS to become the rule and not the exception, the numbers of the permits, the numbers of the certificates are going to be very high. So we need a system uh, that can uh, handle and manage uh, very well that information. Um, good news that you are uh, actually um, um, renewing or revising uh, the, the guidelines and uh, a new version is coming towards the end of this year is about to be approved and released. Importance of having uh, precise information available, uh, extremely important. And capacity building, no? awareness of the, of the system by uh, researchers is also a key element. No? And, and in that sense, the approach of training of, of trainers is, is quite, quite relevant, no? as it was indicated by you. We will come back to you. Um, I want to move on to the next uh, speakers. In this case, we don't have a country, but we have a region, we have the Pacific, and we could not have uh, better support than the colleagues from the South Pacific uh, Environment Program, SPREP, um, that are uh, with us uh, today. In this case, uh, let me introduce you uh, Rahul Harvin Shan, who is the ABS Capacity Building Officer at the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program. Uh, prior to joining uh, SPREP, Rahul uh, was working for the government of Fiji, uh, managing conservation projects, programs, and implementing environmental strategies and policies. In your experience, Rahul, and in the projects that the SPREP um, is implementing in the Pacific. What is the situation of, of ABS in the Pacific? What, what kind of uh, novelties uh, do we have from the region? Hi, hello. Uh, thank you so much. I hope my voice is clear. I have been 
having some problems with the internet connection, so I've switched on. Uh, thank you. All right, so uh, talking about the current situation in the Pacific, I think uh, the countries, uh, of course, at the very first, uh, we know that they are very small island states and we are always uh, lack resources. Uh, and of course, um, uh, whatever little resource we have, we try to use it in such a way to maximize the benefits of those resources. So we are fortunate that at the moment, SPREP is implementing a regional project, which has 14 countries participating in it. And uh, one of the key things that we are working on uh, through this project is to build capacity of the 14 Pacific Island countries in terms of implementing the Nagoya Protocol. When we actually started, uh, most countries did not have anything on ABS. I mean, there was no policies, there was no legislations, there was no uh, codes of practice or anything at all. So uh, not even a simple guideline. So there was a little bit of concern that how do we do this? And so obviously, and there needs a little bit of awareness and then capacity building. So we have done uh, multiple trainings and on contract negotiation, on ABS provisions, on TK issues, uh, on clearing house. Apart from that, we've also developed the uh, gap analysis as well as roadmaps for those countries. So all, all countries, sorry, I'll just try to get a little closer to the device. I hope uh, I'm, I'm a little clear now. So it is, uh, uh, what we have done in the last few years is that we have worked with the countries to develop some sort of policy, some sort of a guideline to help them implement ABS. Uh, we have legislative and policy framework work that we are doing in the region. And one of them uh, that I would like to share today is about Palau. Palau is the first country in the Pacific that has come up with a standalone access and benefit sharing legislation. So they have an act. And what SPREP has done has worked closely with uh, the country, uh, Palau, and uh, we have uh, developed a regulation in line with the act that we had developed. So we have a pool of experts that we work with, APS initiative. So we always... Uh, sorry, I'm Alejandro, I, I think there is a question that people can't hear me, is it true? We can hear you. We, we will let you know if we, there is any problem. So don't worry, go ahead. All right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, we are working with Palau. So based on their ABS legislation, we are now working on their regulation. We have a pool of experts that we draw technical expertise from. Uh, similarly, in many other Pacific Island countries where we are working to develop some sort of policy or legislation, some countries because lack of resources, they may not be able to develop a legislation, a standalone legislation. They may look at what exists and kind of draw upon those as strengths and try to have some sort of a simple guideline or a policy. So what SPREP is doing is working uh, in those areas with countries in terms of providing some kind of a support where countries are able to develop some sort of at least a guideline at the moment most countries in the region are coming up with their policy, uh, whether it's a legislation or not, we'll have to look at it in the long term. So immediately in the last two or three years, what we have been working on is to try to get some kind of a guideline. And it has been very difficult because, you know, whenever we talk about ABS in the Pacific, the first issue is that the research community and the national governments need to come up on the, on the same table and have kind of a dialogue. The reason is there's a lot of mistrust. There's a lot of issues such as, you know, uh, reporting, monitoring uh, has not been done or researchers have, you know, biopiracy and all these issues keeps coming up. So we need to, I mean, it's a challenging task to, to bring that friendly research environment in the Pacific. We want to promote research, but the problem is uh, we have to get both the parties together on board. Of course, I mean, uh, research is a very uh, costly uh, exercise. Uh, there's a lot of investment included. And then, you know, when we talk about ABS, we don't want to uh, create unrealistic um, expectations in communities. So we have to work with governments uh, to make sure that, you know, there's not too much expectations. And then in the research community that is coming in the Pacific kind of uh, begins to feel that these are challenges and, you know, it's very difficult to work with these governments. So that's our role here at SPREP. We assist countries 
in terms of developing policies, in terms of bringing their capacities so that they are able to implement access and benefit sharing. Thank you so much, Raul. Apparently, there was a problem with your sound, and our colleagues are indicating that uh, for the attendees, if they can uh, mute um, original audio, okay? You had uh, to mute original audio. Okay. Thank you, Mari Carmen, for unmute original audio. Sorry, sorry. Sorry for that. Okay, but I think it, it could uh, uh, we we could follow your your intervention. So thank you uh, so much, uh, Rahul, and also for highlighting the the um, the issues that you are facing when you start to implement these kind of policies uh, in a small uh, countries, small island states, as the ones in the Pacific. No, we have also from the region two researchers. Uh, first, we have uh, with us uh, Joape Ginigini, who is the senior scientific officer at the University of the South Pacific. He is a member of the Scientific and Academic Bodies and Indigenous Science Network Association of the Commonwealth uh, Universities. Um, Joape, can you tell us what is your uh, research project that you are conducting at the moment? With genetic resources, and you are based in in Fiji, right? So, what is your experience in in the implementation on on ABS policies in in your country? Thank you, uh, Alejandro, and um, um, I would like to wish uh, Nagoya Protocol um, happy tenth anniversary again. Um, the University of the South Pacific uh, uh, capitalizes on its mandate uh, within the South Pacific to provide uh, scientific uh, advice to policymakers uh, within the region. And uh, the unit that uh, I've uh, been working for for the last 13 years, uh, it's called the Univers Institute of Applied Sciences, is basically uh, the arm that is utilizing uh, scientific uh, expertise within the region. And uh, we, from our past uh, experiences in these 13 years, we've been able to establish uh, collaborations with a few of our uh, colleagues from the University of um, Georgia Tech at uh, Atlanta and the uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography in uh, uh, California as well. So well, for 13 years, we have been running an uh, international cooperative biodiversity group uh, project for bioprospecting. And uh, the project has uh, assisted immensely within the country in terms of providing um, prototype um, methods for bioprospectors bio uh, in, in this instance. Um, and so we've come up with a, uh, an MOU, uh, and this is uh, predating the Nagoya Protocol in Fiji in, uh, in internationally uh, in 1995, which enabled us to do a lot of the work that we have been conducting from 1997 until 1999 and then 2004 we um, received an ICBG grant which continue our research well basically our research is uh, a natural products research to deal with uh, marine organisms uh, ba basically bacteria and uh, invertebrate sponges uh, soft corals and most of these organisms are producing uh, therapeutic uh, compounds, which uh, I believe are uh, well known uh, for producing um, anti-infectives. And um, we continue this research. And in 2014, we entered into a new project called the Jeff uh, Nagoya project in Fiji. It was basically an implement implementation project for, the, for, for ABS in Fiji. And through our, ex our experiences uh, in the ICBG project, we were able to uh, convey some of those knowledge, technical expertise into the, the framework of helping the country uh, set up its ABS uh, policy, which at the moment uh, eventuated in, in a draft uh, policy. Much, I would say, was very uh, meticulous in its design and very thorough in its consultation within the scientific community, the uh, government stakeholders and the research community and the, especially the resource owners as well. 
So uh, from my side, um, there is um, a lot of uh, awareness that needs to be done in terms of uh, uh, letting the regional uh, communities uh, aware of the importance of research and how research can valorize their resources and raise uh, the, the value of those resources in terms of um, um, the uh, services that uh, bioprospecting can actually offer to uh, the region as well. Thank you so much, uh, Joape. And, and I think it's, it's very important, the, the path that you have described along the years, no? Um, with different projects that have been directly connected with ABS, no? That have been supporting also research, no? Uh, yeah. In particular, the, the last one, the Nagoya Protocol uh, Implementation Fund, for instance, no? That in some yeah. countries help to bridge the um, the the previous ICBGs no uh, projects into a uh, next uh, phase. So also research and funding has been connected no between ABS and and uh, this kind of research, which is extremely important no that to 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 highlight that connection as as you did. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, we also have from the Pacific uh, another colleague, uh, Dr. Graham Matheson, um, who is the medical doctor and researcher from the Cook Islands. Uh, he is the former director of the emergency department and currently the senior medical officer at Karenia Private Hospital in Sydney, Australia. His research is based on an ABS agreement with the Cotonou uh, investigating traditional healing plants extracts at UNSW. Dr. Raham, what, what is your experience on, on ABS um, and, and in applying ABS to your research? Because you have been, uh, you have a quite unique ABS agreement no, in the Cook Islands. Can you tell us about it, please? You are muted. How's that? Now, perfect. That was good. Thank you, Alejandro, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, share our story here, and thank you to the other participants, and happy birthday to the Nagoya Protocol. Um, it is 10 years since the Nagoya Protocol. It's also 10 years since our first patents were uh, filed on the ABS project that we commenced, which was 17 years ago. Uh, we, like most other Pacific Island countries, didn't have a framework when we began this research. Uh, but in the Cook Islands, we were quite fortunate about the way our culture and our system was set up. I was doing my uh, medical training and I did a Master's of Biomedical Engineering in a very high quality orthopedic research laboratory. And the opportunity arose to investigate some of our traditional healing um, remedies that were used to heal bone and soft tissue injuries. And there was no framework for me to use, but under our own culture, the requirement to gain permission from not just the landowners, but the, the custodians of the culture in the land was part of our existing culture. And our country had a already established or legally established and traditionally established body of uh, traditional custodians, the Kotunui, who were custodians of our culture, our traditions, and managed several of our environmental um, programs. And so we discussed with them with on first principles basis that it was going to be fair and equitable, um, that the research would have to be done with permission and it would be a long and expensive process and if there were any benefits that they would be shared equitably among the participants. So we, despite not having a Nagoya Protocol framework, we followed the principles which are core to the Nagoya Protocol and we got unanimous support from the Kotsunui and embarked on a research and development project which uh, found that the plants that were traditionally used by our ancestors to improve bone and soft tissue injury did actually influence the healing and biology of bone and the, uh, the ability of the skin to repair itself. And they resulted in a company being set up, which introduced a new problem, 
which we experienced was the Cook Islands was not a signatory to the international patent law. So you, we couldn't own the intellectual property in the Cook Islands. So we had to set up subsidiary companies in Australia in order to own and then further commercialize the research. Um, so this was a, an initial problem because the, our original agreement was set up with the expectation that we would own it in the Cook Islands, um, only to find that that was not feasible to continue. So we had to then assign the intellectual property into a different company that was in a country that was able to access international patents. Um, that was, so we set up a subsidiary company. And so the, the logistics of doing that becomes increasingly difficult. Um, however, difficulties just require more attention and effort. Um, and we managed to overcome the roadblocks with a bit of persistence and we managed to file international patents that were recognized around the world. Um, pleasingly for me personally, in India and China, where objections from their own traditional remedies uh, were raised and overcome with uh, our evidence. Um, so that was a, a specifically useful project. We were recognized in a UN publication um, that was assessing our ABS agreement and that raised our interest in our profile. And we were fortunate to be beneficiaries of a Nagoya Protocol Implementation Fund grant to the Cook Islands, which has uh, completed that process and is in the final stages of getting its legislation to give us a formal framework for future ABS agreements. And that assistance has allowed us to bring a new product to market, which is based on that research with the, the, and the ABS. So we started without a framework, but um, by following first principles, we managed to get an ABS agreement that is Nagoya Protocol compliant, and then use that to help the rest of the country um, align with the Nagoya Protocol. So thank you very much for the assistance from the UNDP and GEF, and uh, for the opportunity to share this tonight. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Joape and Rahul, to share with us for sharing with us the experience in the Pacific, no, uh, which is uh, in contrast, no, with with other experiences in, in in other countries. I think I would like to highlight in in the case in your case, Graham, how uh, for you it was very clear the principles that you have to follow, and even if there was no legislation in place uh, at the country level. Um, there was a strong culture, no, and you follow the traditional uh, paths, and 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 also, if, if I got it correctly, um, the the um, cent centralized uh, management of uh, that uh, traditional processes help it a lot, no, with the case of the council, no, of the Cotonou. Um, yes, we a different. Indeed, we were very lucky and fortunate that our our cultural heritage is preserved um, within our existing legit legal framework, which is not the case in many countries. And that that cultural awareness of what the permissions and respect is still imbued in the society as a whole from a young age. So you, you literally wouldn't chop a tree down in the forest without having permission um, because that's just the way it is. And so fortunately between our cultural heritage and our unified system that brings all of the tribal communities together under one body, we have managed to create a system that was almost natural to our country that fits in a way that might not be quite so natural fit to others. Wonderful experience, although plenty of uh, obstacles as well, no? as you mentioned, and, and we, we don't have enough time to go into that but I'm sure with the next speakers, you will have also some opportunities to, to come back and, and highlight some of the obstacles that you uh, have been facing or you are still facing no? to, to, to put the products in the market. That's true, yes, thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. We have uh, wonderful experiences uh, from uh, Belarus in a region that is starting to develop ABS. Uh, we had experience from India, one of the best uh, well-known countries in the world applying ABS for the last 20 years um, with a very robust and well-established uh, system. And we had also heard the experience uh, from a complete uh, different region, the Pacific region, with a small island stands with, with limited, very limited capacity that are starting to develop 
this system. And we have seen how, in this case, um, a strong cultural uh, traditional processes uh, have compensated um, the lack of uh, legal uh, procedures no? to a certain extent. Um, let's move on to, um, to the next speaker. And thank you very much because you have been uh, keeping uh, your interventions to the, to the time. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Uh, Mary Siachi, who is International Policy Officer at the European Commission uh, within the Multilateral Environmental Cooperation. Her main task uh, focus on the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol and the development of ABS policy and measures in the EU. And she is going to explain us the user compliance measures, uh, uh, the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol in the European Union. Uh, Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandro. Can, can you hear me? Uh, uh, just one, uh, apologies, Mary, before giving you the floor, I forgot to mention to all the participants, all the attendees, that please feel free to write your questions uh, at any time in the Q&A uh, part, okay? Not in the chat, but in the Q&A, which will allow us to identify easily the questions and, and ask them uh, towards the end of the session. Mary, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Can you all hear me? Okay, good, thank you. Thank you for organizing this event, for inviting us, and thanks a lot also to the other colleagues participating for sharing their very interesting experiences. And I hope wherever you are, you keep safe these days. <laughs> so just, um, yeah, what I want to do today is to introduce you a little bit how we have implemented the Nagoya Protocol uh, in the EU and how it works in particular for researchers. So uh, just let me clarify that um, in the EU, we don't have a, a European legislation regulating access to genetic resources or, or traditional knowledge uh, that is valid and and uh, uh, harmonized in the 27 member states. The decisions to regulate taxes uh, to genetic resources falls under the competence of the member states. So this is left to the decisions of the member states. And, and in the EU currently six uh, uh, states have decided to regulate uh, access and you see them listed in my presentation. Um, so our, uh, well, benefit sharing, you know, falls uh, under private terms is a contractual agreement between the users and, and, uh, and the provider. So our uh, uh, regulation focuses on compliance, on the compliance measures that have uh, uh, been set up under the protocol. And it, it was necessary to harmonize this in the EU in order to have a legally binding legislation that would be applicable in all the member states and for all the users in the EU. So all users, uh, users in, the, in the 27 member states are subject to the same uh, uh, rules. Uh, namely, we have done this through the regulation number 511, 2014 that I show here. And you see it focuses on compliance measures. Can we go to the next uh, slide, please? Thank you. Okay, well, this is uh, to, to say that the regulation is complemented by another implementing regulation that set, uh, lays down further details uh, rules and also um, by a guidance document that helps uh, users and competent authorities to understand whether the regulation and the core obligation. So what mainly to what it applies and what they have to do to be compliant with the ABS legislations of provided countries. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so the core obligation in the UABS regulation is the one that we call due diligence obligations, and this uh, applies to all users in the EU, so to uh, the researchers, but also to private companies. Um, in what it consists, mainly we require users in, in the EU to exercise due diligence regarding legality of access and, and benefit sharing. Uh, so all the users uh, in the EU, they have to seek, keep and transfer to subsequent users uh, all the relevant information concerning access to the genetic resources and all the traditional knowledge associated. 
So they have to gather uh, the, uh, to, to obtain the uh, IRCC. And if the IRCC is not available, they have to provide all relevant information concerning the date of access, the place of access, if there are uh, uh, conditions applicable to these genetic resources, if they have a PIC, if they have a MAT, all these informations, they have to be uh, sought kept, stored for 20 years by the, by the users. And in case of transfers of the genetic resources and or the associated traditional knowledge, they have to transfer this information together. Uh, so this is the main core due diligence obligations for all users in the EU, including uh, researchers. In case of insufficient information, the users should discontinue utilization. Uh, how do we monitor? Ah, sorry, can uh, Augustina, next one, please. How can we monitor the users in, uh, uh, in the EU? We have established two checkpoints for, for this. The first checkpoint is the one established at the moment of uh, uh, research funding. So when the researcher um, that utilizes genetic resources and, and or ATK associated to genetic resources receive funds for this research project, he has the obligation to submit a due diligence declaration. This due diligence declaration contains all the information that I um, listed before, all the, re all the reference to the IRCC if this is available. Uh, once the researchers are, uh, has filled this uh, uh, due diligence declaration, and we have created an electronic platform for this that is called DECLARE, but be aware the member states can also have their own platform for this, it's left to their choice. Anyway, they, they collect these and they can file it in an electronic form to the competent authorities. And then the competent authorities will transfer these to the, uh, to the ABS uh, clearinghouse. Uh, and this time, the due diligence declaration turns into the checkpoint uh, communique. And the second uh, checkpoint that we have established in the EU is at the stage of pre-commercialization. So the last, uh, the, the final stage of the development of the product. Uh, and the process is similar. They collect information, they, they file, uh, they, they, they fill this electronic form and they file it uh, uh, to the competent authority. Uh, we have uh, decided to have these two checkpoints because we, uh, uh, upon the results of an impact assessment that we had prepared before adopting the, le the legislation, the regulation, we have thought that it was important to uh, monitor uh, the, the, the compliance of the users along uh, the various stages of, of, the, of the value chain. So this is from where the origin of these two checkpoints come from. Okay, this was a flow chart. Oh, next the slide, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, this is a flow chart to explain how uh, the, 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 the information are gathered and transferred, uh, for instance, at uh, 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 the first checkpoint, that is that one that concerns the researchers. So you see, uh, researchers, when they get funds for the research, are requested by the, by the state or even by the commission, if they get funds from us, to submit this due diligence declaration. They do it via our uh, um, electronic platform or the system that the member states have decided to use. Uh, they file this to the competent authority. Then the, uh, the competent authorities uh, um, transfer these to the ABS clearinghouse and it turns into a checkpoint uh, communique. Of course, if the information are confidential, they will not be transferred to the ABS clearinghouse, but they will be transferred directly from the competent authority to the competent national authority of the provided country. Um, and be aware that um, when the due diligence declaration has to be submitted by researchers, we have uh, uh, left a, um, a window open for the researchers. He can do this from the first installment of the, uh, when he receives the, the research grant until the last uh, final stage of development of the research project. So just before he, he, he hands his uh, um, uh, final report or, or, or the final results of the, of the research project. So this can vary, right? So uh, we can go to the next slide, please. 
Okay, this is the, the second checkpoint. I will uh, uh, just, uh, the, the process is similar, so I will not repeat it, uh, just to flag that uh, uh, the moments that we have identified as the final stage of development of the product are, for instance, the authorization. If you need an authorization to put a product on the market, then at that time you have to file your due diligence declaration. You have to show so that you have uh, uh, created your product in uh, fully compliance with, uh, with uh, uh, ABS regulations of the provider country or if you, if you need a notification, uh, or just at the moment when you place the, the product on the market, or if you plan to transfer the result of your utilization, uh, or, or also the, the transfer the, uh, the outcome of the, of the utilizations somewhere else outside the EU, I mean. Okay, we can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, okay. Besides the monitoring uh, obligations and, uh, and the due diligence obligations for users, in the EU, we have also uh, set up an obligation upon the member states to check on their users' compliance. So um, the users have the obligation to file the due diligence declaration, so to show that they have been compliant uh, uh, when they, they, they utilize the genetic resources with the ABS obligations of the provider country. But the, the competent authorities in the member states, they can also um, uh, decide to do on-site uh, uh, visits or, 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 or online checks, for instance, to the users. So we know uh, these, these uh, checks are organized uh, on, uh, on a, a risk-based uh, uh, approach plan that is developed by the member states and is periodically reviewed. Uh, several member states have started to carry out uh, their checks. We know uh, uh, that they, they go on, uh, on spot, they go on the, on the site, they visit uh, the, the company, for instance, but also the researchers, and, uh, and they uh, ask if they have all the information, if the, the genetic resources that they are using uh, uh, falls under the scope of the regulation, so if there are ABS requirements that are applicable. So for now, things uh, uh, are going ahead. Uh, and know also that uh, we, uh, uh, the member states have established, they have, have, have the obligation to establish uh, uh, penalties in case they find that the users have not, has not respected the compliance obligation. So if the users has not uh, uh, obtained the, the, the relevant information or the documentation uh, to, to show that he's compliant with the uh, uh, ABS requirements, he can be punished uh, under the, the, the terms of the UABS regulation. These sanctions can change from a country to another one in the EU because, again, this is something that has to be decided uh, internally by the, by the member states. So this can vary, but in all member states, except the one that is now in the process of adopting the penalties, all the penalties have been uh, adopted and established. Next one, please. Okay, and, and finally, to, to continue to support the users uh, with their compliance obligations, under the UABS regulation, we have also established two voluntary tools. Uh, one is the registered collections, and the other one is uh, ABS, the recognition of ABS best practices. Uh, the principle behind the register collection is that if a user obtain genetic resources from a register collection, he is considered to be compliant for the seeking of information. What does that mean? Mainly, it means that um, uh, it, it actually a collection to become a register collection have to set up uh, tools and procedures to show that the, the material that they hold in their collection is. ABS compliant, so the, the, all the relevant information related to ABS requirement is uh, in, um, uh, in the uh, collection together with the material, and they have to inform in case uh, uh, the, the, the researcher uh, or, or the, the user that obtained the information has to fulfill additional ABS obligation, they have to inform the users about it. So when, uh, when a collection is able to prove that they have all these systems, it can ask a member state to be recognized as a, as a, a, a registered collection. And, and then the, the member states communicate to the commission uh, this decision. And we have established, the commission has established an online register where we upload all relevant information. Currently, we have three registered collections in, uh, in the EU. Uh, then we have uh, final thoughts, uh, Mary, because we are yeah. running out of time. 
And then we also have possibility to have ABS best practices recognized. We have one in, uh, in, uh, in the EU. Just next slide. Uh, can we go ahead? OK, thank you. So uh, you may wonder if the system works. <laughs> does, it, does the, this system work in the European Union? Well, uh, I have to say that for now, what we see is that in the in the ABS clearinghouse, there are 31 checkpoints communique and 28 are from the European Union. So these these figures come from uh, last time I checked the, the ABS clearinghouse, so more or less a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so if if you look at this, the system is fully working and operational from uh, uh, from, from this point of view. One may wonder why there is a relatively small amount of checkpoints communique. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, there are, uh, there were of course, uh, uh, um, uh, there was the need to, to, to have some time to make the system operational. Member states had to designate a competent authority. We had to develop a tool to transfer the information in a safe uh, uh, way to respect also privacy issues and, and, and etc. But there is also another aspect that needs to be taken into account, which is the time that is needed for a research project to be developed or for a product to be developed. Uh, and so if, uh, if uh, uh, researchers have the opportunity to send a due diligence declaration, so that will be coming at a checkpoint communique, uh, during uh, the, the, the development of this research project, this can really vary. It can be at the beginning of the project, but also at the end. And, and a project can last uh, from five to six years, but also more. Sometimes we know that it can also last 10, uh, 10 years, and similarly for the development of, of a product. We can go to the next one, and I will almost uh, conclude it. Uh, so uh, what was the impact of the UABS uh, regulation for ABS in general? I have to say that this has significantly increased the level of awareness about ABS in the European uh, Union among stakeholders, both researchers and the private sector as well. Though I have to say that researchers were less aware than the private sector about uh, the, the ABS. Um, there, is, there are also considerable efforts done by our researchers now to comply with ABS requirements of provided countries because they know that they can also be checked and, and they can uh, be uh, punished, they, they can uh, have uh, uh, penalties in case they, are, they, they cannot show their compliance uh, um, to the authorities. And in general, I think it has contributed to put ABS into governmental agendas in, uh, in the European uh, Union. Final slide, please. Of course, I mean, it's not all roses. We also have issues. We also have challenges. The first one is that ABS is quite a complicated, highly technical uh, topic, and it's a challenge uh, not only for the users, but also for the authorities. Sometimes uh, they, they don't know how to... Uh, uh, handle with it, with it. So we, we realize that there is a continuous need for raising awareness, for building capacity as well uh, in, in uh, the European Union. And in general, a, a, a challenge that our users encounter is the variety of ABS domestic legislations worldwide. This is something that we hear often from, from the users and in particular from researchers. They are happy to comply with ABS requirements, but they see that this can really be different from a country to another one. Legislations can vary, and sometimes they, they, they feel puzzles and they struggle to get the, 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 the information to have expeditors, expeditors answers from the competent authorities, and this is to some extent discouraging them. But uh, work is in progress. <laughs> okay, I can conclude here. Thank you, Thank very, you very much, much uh, Mary. In this case, I have to say that you have taken uh, some extra minutes, uh, but thank you very much because it's very important to also uh, explain that the Nagoya Protocol introduced a truly international system of access and benefit sharing. Uh, provided countries are not alone anymore, but they can rely on the compliance measures that user countries that are party to the Nagoya Protocol need to put in place, which has been the case, as you uh, very well explained, uh, of the EU through this uh, compliance system and checkpoints. No? Um, I would like to ask, uh, after your presentation, uh, go back to our previous uh, speakers from Belarus, India, or uh, SPREP, 
to ask them two questions. First, first if they have noticed um, the, imp the impact of the EU regulation. So if they have had any impact in their uh, countries, the implementation of the EU uh, legislation. And the second is if they have compliance measures, if they have established checkpoints, which is one of the biggest challenges probably of the uh, Nagoya Protocol and the ABS system, no? So I don't know who wants to answer or if any of you wants to answer, colleagues from the Pacific, um, colleagues from India or colleagues from, yes, I think Tatiana from Belarus wants to reply. Можно я скажу? Я хотела бы отметить, что вот система, которая создана в Европейском Союзе, она прекрасно работает, потому что мы уже на себе, скажем так, заметили ее работу. Благодаря четкой отлаженной системе, которая у нас у них имеется, к нам, например, обратились с Франции организация СЭПИК за получением соответствующего сертификата на чернику, которая является нашим ресурсом. То есть я хочу сказать, что вот благодаря хорошей работе контрольных пунктов и других систем, созданных в рамках Нагойского протокола и Европейского Союза в частности, вот, вот эта система, она стимулирует выполнение в общем во всем мире Нагойского протокола. Поэтому мы на себе точно уже почувствовали положительный эффект от созданной системы в Евросоюзе. Спасибо. And Tatiana, thank you. Very, very short and concise uh, intervention and very clear. Do you have checkpoints? Have you designed uh, and introduced checkpoints in Belarus? У нас на сегодняшний день создан такой контрольный пункт мониторинга. Он есть. Но а, практики опыта так такового м, в части проверки а, других ресурсов с других стран у нас нет. Но это пока. <laughs> Мы надеемся, что скоро у нас будет в том числе и эта практика. Спасибо. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, any colleagues from India or from Rahul? Yes, I can see you now in your beach. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to share one small point about the checkpoints in the Pacific. I think uh, Samoa is one country that has a checkpoint. The other Pacific island countries could have, if we go through what Samoa's experience is. We had this uh, national workshop happening where you were there as well. Uh, and uh, it so happened that you know during the process, uh, one of the participants said, hang on, there, there seems to be a checkpoint already designated, uh, not designated, already identified by the law. So uh, during the workshop, we realized that yes, some already has provisions for a checkpoint within their legislation, the patents office. So uh, that's probably the first for the Pacific. Uh, the other Pacific Island countries do not have yet, but they have patents office, they have their IP offices. And I think it's just a, a lessons learned for us that we probably have to look at some of the legislations and see maybe there are provisions for checkpoints and we just need to get that done. So um, that was a good experience for, for the Pacific and, and we hope to work with other countries to find similar experiences. Thank you. That was a, a funny moment. I was there also attending the ABS week in Samoa a year ago. And it's true during the meeting suddenly, you know, uh, one of our ex experts, colleagues, just realized that the uh, patent legislation uh, from Samoa that was modified some years ago, uh, recently uh, introduced uh, the, the patent office as a, a checkpoint, no? Which was even a surprise for the patent office no? from, from the country. Um, but it shows how difficult it is to introduce this and how difficult it is to operationalize, no? And actually in some regions like uh, the Pacific, 
maybe uh, it would be wise to think about regional checkpoints, no? To 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 get um, uh, to have uh, to scale, no? Up uh, this kind of uh, uh, institutions or checks. Thank you. Fantastic. Alejandro, yep. can I come in? Please, yes, we were waiting for you, Dr. Mathur. Uh, I, I, as I just said that our uh, access and benefit sharing guidelines, which came into 2014, we are now in the process of revising them. And in the revision, in, in, in the revision, we are now designating the National Biodiversity Authority as the checkpoint. So in, in a few months time, it would be possible that uh, the National Biodiversity Authority will be playing the much needed role of the checkpoint for this entire process. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mathur, and, and very good news that um, India is also coming uh, with this uh, designation of the, comp of the National Biodiversity Authority as the checkpoint. Please, if you have any questions to the panelists, uh, just write your questions in the Q&A uh, section, and we will try towards the end of the session to um, ask uh, those questions. Thank you so much to all the panelists for sharing all these experiences um, that has provided us um, um, a very nice view of what is happening in the different countries in all this bus area of Asia Pacific and uh, CIS uh, countries as well. Um, we would like to move on now into the second part of the session uh, where we want to get into the emerging issues or issues that need to be addressed. Um, in this case, the issue of uh, digital sequence information, right? Um, and I would like to make a short introduction of, of this part. Um, as you know, the issue of digital, digital sequence information on genetic resources was uh, first raised at COP13 uh, in Cancun, uh, Mexico in 2016. At the time, the parties decided to consider at their next respective meetings any potential implications of the use of this information for the objectives of the convention and the Nagoya protocol. The term digital sequence information does not have an internationally agreed meaning, and it is just used as a kind of placeholder until there is more clarity on the concept and its scope. Then more appropriate term terminology uh, could be developed and used. In decision uh, 14 slash 20, parties recognize the importance of digital sequence information on genetic resources for the three objectives of the convention, which are mutually supportive and that access to and use of digital sequence information contributes to scientific research as well as to other non-commercial and commercial activities. It was also recognized that further capacity to access, use, generate and analyze DSI is needed in many countries. However, there is a divergence of views among parties regarding benefit sharing arising from the use of DSI. The issue relates to the increasing speed and failing costs of sequencing, which have resulted in an enormous quantity of biological data being produced and stored in different uh, types of uh, data banks which are used for research and development, including also for commercial purposes. This happens in the ab absence of benefit sharing obligations and many parties and other actors are concerned that this will negatively impact on the third objective 
of the Convention and in the main objective of the Nagoya Protocol. Others are concerned that imposing access and benefit sharing obligations on digital sequence information will have a negative impact on open access to information for research, including for conservation and sustainable use. Bearing in mind the importance of new technologies for the current and future utilization of genetic resources needs, this point needs to be further considered and a concerted and cost-effective international approach to this issue will clearly help to provide legal certainty for all parties involved. We are privileged today to have with us experts from different areas that are going to help us to better understand digital sequence information and its status in the CBD negotiations. So I'm going to take advantage of these experts and I'm going to ask them uh, some questions. First of all, I would like to introduce uh, Chris Lyle and uh, Ms. Leticia Situamulomoni. My apologies, Leticia. Um, uh, as a good friend, I should uh, better know how to pronounce your, your surname. My apologies for that. Chris and Leticia are the co chairs of the ad hoc technical expert group on digital sequence information on genetic resources. Um, Chris uh, is a bio bio biological scientist and, and he has been engaged with ABS for approximately uh, 16 years in the non-commercial biodiversity research and the Nagoya Protocol field. And Leticia is the deputy director at the Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries and has 15 years of working experience in the field of bioprospecting, access and benefit sharing policy development and implementation. My question to you, and thank you so much, Chris and Leticia for being with us today, is what is DSI and why is relevant for access and benefit sharing? Okay, thank you, Alejandro. Um, I trust you can now see, see my screen. So yes, yes we will <clears throat> give a, a, a quick overview, if you like, of what DSI might mean, what it is thought to mean by various peoples, and where we are now with, with a way forward in that discussion. First of all, where does it come from? So generally DSI, and I'm going to carry on using this handy little, very easy acronym. It's generated during research processes. Um, and many research pro processes produce DSI. At the simplest, that's sequencing DNA and RNA from organisms, from genetic resources. It can include structural annotation of those sequences. So how are they folded? How do they interact, if you like, physically? The functionality of genes, what do they code for? And then looking at what they code for, the proteins, the analysis of those protein molecular structures. It can also be her heritable factors, which are not, not, not actually in the, the genes at all. Um, Epigenetic mod modifications, they're called. Methylation factors have been discussed quite a lot recently. And all of those other chemicals in the cell, the cell metabolites. Now, in the picture in the corner there, you've got a photograph of one of my colleagues who is um, carrying out research on a group of insects in Central and South America. The picture of her is part of her process of extracting DNA and sequencing that DNA so she can distinguish between different species and look at their evolution. She will ultimately publish that work. And as one of the conditions of publication, and also this is not just an academic nicety, is to enable researchers elsewhere, including, of course, in the countries in Central and South America, 
where these insects occur, to be able to match her work, to use her work, to identify the things themselves, she'll publish the sequences necessarily online. Open access, um, open access database. Now I've got an image there of a, the logo of the big consortium, the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration. That has millions upon millions of sequences available for use globally. It's a consortium of three big databases, but it's not the only place you can look for DSI. Um, that consortium, those databases themselves, feed into 1,700 or more other databases. There are other databases out there. There are thousands of databases where you can find this information. So the key concept of DSI is that the availability of these research results, the DSI itself, is available globally, but outside the direct control of the provider country of the original genetic resources, they're just open access. This is fine, there are lots of benefits about that. But let's not go into that at the moment. So third parties can download and use that DSI. So as Alejandro said, DSI is a placeholder. It's handy for use in CVD negotiations. And, but what does it mean? Now, there are different concepts of what it might be, more or less exclusive. And the image I've got here is from a report commissioned by the, for the CVD and provided to the RTEC, an amazingly useful one. Um, and you can look at it if you like more and more inclusive from a simple order of nucleotides in a strand of DNA, DNA, that's a sequence of letters when you see it typed out, to the structure of proteins for which the DNA is coding, the biochemical composition of molecules and cells, metabolites, and broad of all, including additional information, subsidiary information, it's been called. And that huge inclusive um, concept might be termed natural information. It might be termed in silico information. I'm not going to go into huge detail about definitions. If you look at that report, and I'll give you a link later, that will enable you to find that out. That was provided to the Arte because one of the issues is, of course, is negotiators are talking about this concept, this thing DSI, but they need to know what they're discussing. They need to know what they're basing conclusions on. And they need to know when they're talking about different things. So it is really necessary for negotiators to understand, decide what coverage they're using. So the remit of the RTEG, the Ad Hoc Technical Expert Group, um, which was drawn globally, of course, um, included developing options for operational terms and their implications to provide conceptual clarity on DSI. And the RTEG made, made use of that report that I mentioned. Um, there's a little URL in, in the corner there, and it'll be in the next couple of slides as well, where you can find all these documents if you wish to look at them. So the RTEG looked at that and came up with a classification of three different groups using the rationale of, of the degree of biological processing involved to produce that particular type of DSI and the proximity to the underlying genetic resource. Now that's a, the table that's in the, the RTEG report. And you see there are, there are three groups there. Initially, DNA and RNA, the nucleotides. The second would include that um, and includes also proteins and those epigenetic modifications, the things outside the nucleus. And the third includes both of those and other metabolites and other macro macromolecules. And you'll see there the associated information is treated separately. So as I say, those three groups are cumulative. Two includes all one, three includes, includes all one and two. But the RTEG made a distinction between that genetic and biochemical information in one to three and the associated information, the contextual information, the information about how the DNA was extracted, about how the analysis was taking place, about um, the environment where the original genetic resource was found, all sorts of things, but critically also including 
um, associated with additional knowledge. So it felt that the associated information would not be considered DSI, although the RTEG very clearly recalled um, and noted obligations on utilization of associated traditional knowledge under the protocol. It wasn't trying to dismiss that, but it was trying to refine ideas of what DSA might be. So the RTEG report is there, but that is not binding on anybody. That's information which is now being provided to the negotiators for their, for their use. So it's over to the negotiators for that one. And now I'm going to go over to Leticia, who's going to talk about why DSI is relevant for ABS discussions. Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you, Alejandro, for this opportunity to share with the participants why is DSI relevant for ABS? Um, DSI is generally um, believed or understood to be um, a product of utilization of genetic resources. So in other ways, without a physical genetic resources, um, you will not have um, a, a DSI um, uh, developed or generated. So, but um, once this DSI is developed, um, it can be used in some cases as a surrogate for the original genetic resources in the research and development process, whereby you find that um, the researchers are no longer um, requiring a physical access to the actual genetic resources, but they are able to carry on with their research and development work using uh, that uh, GSI that has been generated. And again, um, as Chris has already presented and shared with you how DSI is, is developed and, 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 you know, and stored in this big uh, databases. So you'll find that um, uh, the acquiring and, and, and the using of such uh, DSI uh, tend to now operate outside the modalities worked out in the Nagoya protocol, reason being that um, once that data is, is stored or that sequence is stored in those big databases, then they are subjected to what we call open access and, and, and the researchers can easily access it and work on it. Whereas the Nagoya protocol has got a set process where there must be a prior informed consent in place and the mutually agreed terms that needs to be followed before you can even access the resource. But uh, once the DSI is generated and provided uh, through the, the, the established databases, then um, it actually uh, introduces a, a different uh, modality of accessing such uh, data and, and utilizing it. And for, for that reason, we, it, it, it brings to various views from uh, many countries seeing it as a workflow that can lead to the same outcome as, as utilization of genetic resources, but it lacks the benefit sharing uh, requirement element because um, it, when, when the access does take place, then there is no that, um, uh, ABS modality that requires the, the, the user to um, commit to some benefit sharing arrangement through mutually agreed terms and other, other means. And, and, and these countries are now um, approaching the, the CBD to say, uh, can you help us come up with a modality that could ensure that there is still benefit sharing even from the use of DSI that we believe that it originally um, developed from a, a, a utilization of a genetic resource. And again, um, other countries, just to show the seriousness of the matter, we found from the various views and the studies that were conducted by the CBD secretariat that there are national legislation that have already included um, D 
DSI as, as one of the key component to, to regulate uh, within the ABS uh, framework, but they are also seeking means of addressing uh, benefit sharing under a, a global uh, system through the, the CBD. So that is what they are, they are now asking um, uh, uh, the, the CB, the global community to look at. And I think that they are approaching the, the global community because they've identified some of the limitations uh, that, that, that comes with the national framework. For example, you will find that at a national level, uh, you've, you've done your ABS um, requirements with a researcher who does not even have any interest in the commercial or the further development of the sequence that is going to be generated. And once they, 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 they deposit those sequences and, and publish their papers, I think their business it, it's done and they're no longer interested in, in further development of that uh, product or sequence. So it's, it's out there and whoever access it or it get mixed with other things. So they do not even want to be involved maybe in the um, commercialization discussion of that particular sequence. So that's the reason why they're saying, uh, let's see if at a global level is we can come up with uh, innovative solution that could still uh, address the gap that has been identified regarding uh, benefit sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia, and thank you, Chris, for a very clear uh, presentation in just uh, 12 minutes on, on, the, <clears throat> on the why is important uh, DSI uh, in regard to, to ABS. The next question that comes to, to our mind would be who is using DSI, no? Is this just a matter of um, developed countries and, and uh, rich in, in, in terms of uh, technology, uh, technological capacity, or is uh, a matter that everyone is using digital uh, sequence information? To answer this question, we are very lucky to have uh, Dr. Amber Scholes, who is the deputy uh, to the director at the Leibniz Institute DSMZ, the German collection for microorganisms and cell cultures in Germany. She headed the team that led to, the, to her institution becoming the first registered collection under the Nagoya Protocol in the European Union. And she was also the head author on the combined study on digital sequence information in public and private database and traceability, submitted in January 2020 uh, to the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. So I think we could not have anyone better placed than Amber to answer uh, this question of who is using digital sequence information. Thank you, Alejandro. What a kind introduction and thank you to the organizers. I am going to give you a crash course uh, with lots of world maps. So um, I have a few more than 10 slides, but I think I'll be able to quick somewhat quickly and show you a lot of pictures today. So the question I'm trying to answer is who is using DSI and I'm going to focus in the second half of the talk on Asia and CIS countries. So the first thing you need to know is that the first part of the talk has already been published actually since January, as Chris and Leticia pointed out, there are already studies out there commissioned by the CBD Secretariat. This is called CBD study, DSI study 2.3. The link is down there and it focuses on databases and traceability. And we had a very clear mandate. The one little science piece that I want you to take from my talk is that if you are proud of your country's unique biodiversity, and you should be, you have to also see at the same time a scientific reality about that. Specifically that this sequence data can only be understood if it's compared to others. So imagine that you're back in school and that you have a quiz and your teacher says, what does this mean? And you look at these letters, AACC, GTC, and you can't, you can't say that, right? So how do you figure that out? And what scientists basically do is we take these letters and we compare them to letters and build on the results of others and say, ah, 
another person had a piece of DNA that looked a little bit like this and they figured out the function beforehand. And so right now there are 212 million sequences in the databases and the bigger the data set gets, the better we get at understanding these letters. So think about learning a new language. So I had to learn German at, at one point and I love to sort of break down words into their parts. So if you look at the German word for strawberry, Erdbeer, and you look at the German word for um, peanut, it's Erdnuss. And if you see the front part of the, both of those words is E-R-D. And it turns out that that's the German word for the ground or the earth. And so the, 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 as we learn about DNA, as we learn a new language, we look for these associations and realize these are both plants that grow very close to the earth, close to the ground. And although it's a lot more complex and there's a lot of different word combinations and letter combinations possible, this is basically the principle of why scientists take new DNA to compare it and study it in big databases, because the letters mean nothing without comparison to others. So with that little science crash course, I'd like to answer three questions. What is the flow of DSI? Is DSI mostly derived from genetic resources from developing countries? And is this DSI then mainly used by science, scientists in developed countries? This sort of one-way street that we often have as a stereotype from the provider user um, concept. The first answer is most DSI at present does not come from low and middle income countries. So if you look at these world maps, you can see that over half of the DSI in the databases was geographically sourced from. I'm not saying where it was sequenced. I'm saying it geographically was sourced from. The country of origin is China, United States, Canada, and Japan. You can also see other countries from the Asia region, um, such as Japan and India, uh, playing very important roles in sourcing the DSI to these large databases. But it's important to recognize that the majority right now comes from these four countries. There are 10 to 15 million users of the core DSI databases. And that's that acronym that Chris mentioned to you, the INSDC. And there are literally users in every single country in the world. But perhaps very logically, we see those users being uh, in the same places as the places where the DSI is sourced from. So again, the United States, China, India, Japan being towards the top here. The other interesting lesson about users is this concept of infrastructure, of costs, of trying to figure out how can, how can benefit sharing take place. The INSDC, this core database, actually costs 50 million US dollars per year, which roughly comes out to about three to five US dollars per user. About half of the users of the database live in countries that do not contribute to these infrastructure costs. They are mainly carried by EU member states, the US and Japan. And one could interpret that the use of by users outside of these countries is in essence subsidized. The other interesting thing you can do with these two previous maps is ask what is the ratio between provisioning of data, provisioning DSI from genetic resources and use of the databases. And if you take users and you divide by sequences provided from that country's uh, genetic resources, you see that there are countries that dominate in terms of use. They use more than they provide into that system. And again, you see countries like we've heard from today, so Belarus, Ukraine, um, and other areas, uh, Korea here in this um, Asia CIS region. Another interesting thing that we've done is to ask sort of about trade blocks and then to look at the publications of DSI. So if you look at each of these bar graphs here, this is the country of origin for the DSI. The colors then say the author's location. So these are authors located in an OECD country. So that would traditionally be developed countries. These are the BRICS countries, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South, uh, South Africa. And then these are the G77, the traditional um, developing countries. So you can see more often than not, the OECD-based scientists or the authors of these DSI-based publications use OECD data. So again, here using the G77 data, you see again, the OECD, there are OECD authors using G77 data, and there are also G77 
authors, scientists using their own data. And again, this seems trend. But the important thing that we want to look at here is how much the scientists use their own geographically sourced data and that everybody is indeed using everything. So I think I've answered these first three questions. Number one, the flow of DSI, it's often sourced and used in the same place. On average, and a US scientist is on average using US sourced genetic resources. Is DSI mostly derived from genetic resources from developing countries? No, not at the current moment. And is it then used by scientists in developed countries? No, also not predominantly. So now I would like to walk you through four case study questions, a case study countries and their use of DSI. India, Belarus, Palau, and China, just to get a, a sampling of very different types of countries. So the first one is India. Indian DSI, when we look at the publications and the first author's location of these DSI-based publications, there are um, 90 countries that use data, DSI data, from India. Then if we look at the next question and we ask, what are Indian scientists using? Indian scientists are using data from 141 other countries. And they have, according to um, the study, about 360,000 users. Belarusian DSI is used by about 23 countries. So um, that is being provisioned out to these countries that have these dark lines. And on the other side, Belarusian scientists are using DSI from 19 other countries and have about 4,000 users. Palau DSI is used by 14 countries. But interestingly, here in Palau, there are as so far, no Palauan scientists that are using DSI from other countries. And there are only 12 users. Remember that it's a very small island state, that there are only 17,000 um, inhabitants. And, and so maybe this is not surprising, but this is, again, you might say a discrepancy or a disparity. Uh, China, a huge player when it comes to sequence data, Chinese DSI is being used by 117 countries. And Chinese scientists are using DSI from 191 countries. So using from more countries than they're being used by. And again, almost a million users here, a really big player. So the take home messages I hope you've heard today is that when we look at these country level DSI networks, DSI flows in both directions. In almost every case I showed you, everyone is providing DSI from their genetic resources and everyone's using it. Are you curious? Did you not see your country here today? I'm happy to provide a country specific DSI briefing and look up these numbers for you, either in a one on one phone call or video chat, or if you want to organize something more formally. And number three, let's all follow up. And that's the beauty of this, this global ABS project that Alejandro and colleagues organized to create these communities and to really allow for us to engage with each other. So talk to your own scientists in your country, learn how and why they use DSI and how open access enables their own biological research. I'd like to acknowledge the colleagues here. This isn't all my own personal work, but as you can see, um, many of us working hard together and again from many different countries, in including uh, Cameroon, um, Pakistan, India, and China. And with that, thank you. Thank you so much, Amber, for synthesizing in 10 minutes all this uh, great information that shows clearly um, the relevance of DSI and also how it is being used no, in the region. So thank you so much for offering these uh, pictures of how uh, DSI from different countries um, is being used and how the users of those countries are being uh, using the information from other countries as well. From other countries. Um, but I'm still a lawyer, you know? So even if you show me these pictures, um, I'm quite slow to understand these kind of things. Um, so we would like to hear even from a more uh, direct case that can uh, provide us an image of how DSI actually becomes something tangible, no? And in order to do that, we have uh, Christine uh, Pratt, who is um, in charge of a working group on biobanking access to resources, marketing, business intelligence at the European Consortium uh, European Virus Archive. 
Uh, she is also the secretary of the French uh, uh, expert group on Nagoya Protocol uh, EU registry for uh, biobanks. Christine, can you tell us a practical experience where DSI relates to access to pathogens and, and health emergencies? Yes, thanks. So I'll, uh, I'll quickly go through uh, our own experience there at uh, the European Virus Archive. And I'm going to talk about pathogens and uh, health emergencies. Um, so we are all very aware of uh, what an emerging virus can cause to uh, global health, global economy and everything with the COVID-19 situation that we're all living at the moment. But basically, when an emerging virus causes an outbreak, there are many, many questions. So some of them are represented here. You, the public authorities are wondering what are the range of symptoms? What is the mechanism of transmission of the virus? Uh, what are the dynamics of the epidemics? And what is the sequence of the pathogen, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, there is an urgency to gather information to develop appropriate countermeasures. So how do we um, how to how do we gather this information and what is needed to gather this information? So maybe the first point is diagnostics. You cannot follow the epidemics and you cannot follow mechanisms of transmission and everything if you don't have like a proper diagnostics. And for that, you need you need uh, what are called positive controls. You, so you are all aware now of what a PCR a diagnostic test is. And to do this test, you need to check that um, technically speaking, uh, you are indeed uh, detecting the right pathogen and not mixing it up with something else. So you need positive controls and those positive controls are genomic material uh, typically. And you need diagnostic kits then you need to do fundamental research as well. Uh, you want to know um, how the virus is entering the cells, how it infects, what is causing the pathogenesis, etc. And for that, you need viral strains, you need genomic material, proteins, you need training as well sometimes. And to do applied research, by applied research, I mean finding cures, antivirals, vaccines, whatever it takes. To do applied research, you also need viral strains. You cannot develop a vaccine or uh, an antiviral if you cannot check in vitro, in vivo, clinically, if the product you're developing is working on the actual virus. So you need, you need viral strains to check sensibility and specificity. And you don't only need the one virus that is emerging, you also need to compare it to other clinically related viruses or epidemiologically related viruses. <clears throat> so the problematic here is where to find those resources and how to get them quick. So I thought I would give you a little bit of an introduction on what biobanks are, because uh, not all of you may be familiar with the term. So uh, specifically biobanks in times of emerging disease outbreaks. So. Um, when an outbreak starts with an emerging virus, by definition, as the virus is not known, there is no market by definition. It means that uh, if you want to have access to kits, diagnostics, etc., the private companies do not have any product on the market. By definition, they didn't have time to study and to, and to design tests. So uh, at those times, in the first three months, four months of a pandemic or, or, or of an outbreak, biobanks are really key because they are prepared, they are organized, and they are willing to share. It means that they have procedures in place to respond to end users' requests, basically. So I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, my organization. It's the European Virus Archive. So the European Virus Archive, we call it EVA, uh, is an EU-funded research infrastructure. It's a biobank that is collecting viruses and associated materials, such as genomes, proteins, antibodies, diagnostic kits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm going to present here two case studies of uh, emerging viruses that caused uh, outbreaks. So first, I'm going to talk about the Zika virus outbreak, and secondly, about the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, the case study number one, the Zika virus outbreak in the Americas. 
So Zika virus, a little bit of introduction, uh, was first discovered in 1947 in a forest in Uganda. It emerged in Brazil in May 2015 and spread to 87 countries with a total number of cases approaching 1 million in 18 months, so a very quick dissemination. Um, it was believed at first to cause uh, a mild dengue-like syndrome resolving by itself in a few days, but uh, later on during the epidemics it was discovered that the range of pathologies was actually much broader and that the transmission mode would, uh, could not only be through mosquito bites, but also vertical transmission from pregnant mothers to their fetus and horizontal through sexual transmission. So a much more complicated um, situation that was originally thought. And uh, what we did at the biobank, at the EVA biobank, is that we had a, a Zika virus that was isolated very quickly in Marseille from a traveler returning from Martinique. Martinique is a French department overseas and uh, another returning traveler coming back from French Polynesia. So those uh, viruses were extracted from the serum of those patients and RNA as well was extracted from, from these viruses. The genetic material was extracted and um, it was put on our biobank and then it was massively distributed after the World Health Organization classified the Zika virus outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern. So I've put here in, 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 this, uh, in this picture, on the bottom left, uh, you can see uh, that uh, the, the main things that we distributed was, was viral strains, but we also distributed um, genomic material, derived products, and also diagnostics reagents. And this is a map representing the global distribution of Zika-related EVA products uh, worldwide. Um, the second case study is uh, even more, uh, more interesting, is the case of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Okay, so I'm, I've represented here in this timeline here, uh, the dates uh, that are important for our case study. Uh, so the, the, the viral, I mean, the outbreak was first, re first reported in China uh, on the 31st of December, 2019. Uh, and it was attributed to a novel coronavirus. But then on the 10th of January, 2020, um, China released a genomic sequence of SARS-CoV-2, a new coronavirus that was named sars coronavirus 2 And this release was done as a digital sequence information. And this uh, gesture, this, uh, this action changed completely um, the fate of the epidemics. Um, very quickly after, so four days later, our partners from Charité in Berlin uh, designed, because that's their expertise, they designed diagnostics positive control and uh, a diagnostic kits, basically. That was WHO recommended. And as soon as they did that, we received uh, an, a huge number of orders going through uh, the, the EVA website. Literally, like every 10 seconds, we had another order, another order, another order. And um, very quickly on during the month of January, there was unfortunately the first autochthonous cases in Germany, France, and Spain. And um, the virus themselves were isolated from those, uh, from those persons. And they were added to the, to the EVA catalog for order by scientists and public health um, uh, institutes. On the 9th of February, so not even a month after the digital, the digital sequence information was shared, um, we were able to design a diagnostic kit consisting of primer, probes, and positive control uh, for shipment at room temperature. And that changed everything as well, because shipment at room temperature all over the world was much uh, easier to do than shipping at minus 20. 
uh, we also had a diagnostics training. So I've represented here um, a map to show from the week number three, that's the 10th of January 2020, until the week number 13, which is basically end of March 2020. So in just like not even three months, I've, I've shown little maps with changing colors, um, with uh, EU countries, ordering, I mean, requesting our diagnostic positive controls and kits to prepare for the pandemic. So basically very early on, mid-January, you can see that a fair number of European countries had already thought, okay, this pandemic is gonna um, go wild maybe, and we need to be prepared for diagnostic settings in our country. So thanks to the digital sequence sharing, um, we were able to send free of charge to those, to those countries diagnostic kits to help them prepare to diagnose the first cases and to monitor the epidemics in their country. So you see week by week the number of countries ordering a number of institutions in each country ordering products to prepare uh, increase over time. And basically at the end, I mean I took this data uh, nine months later, Nine months later, we, we have distributed the, our products to 114 countries uh, in nine months. So basically, uh, this last slide is really an open discussion. Um, I wanted to show that digital sequence information in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also biological resources, as we saw uh, in the case of the Zika virus outbreak, sharing can change the face of an epidemic. And not sharing, on the contrary, could pose a threat. One health would be impacted. Um, distribution in the perspective of the Nagoya protocol is benefit sharing. And um, the pandemic influenza preparedness framework, the PIP framework, is an example of a solution developed for uh, preventing a pandemic happening they just focused on influenza viruses, but we believe it could be um, potentially applied to other pathogens. So it's based basically, it's a complicated framework, but it's based on two main points, the rapid sharing of influenza virus with WHO collaborating centers and benefit sharings, meaning access to and distribution of affordable diagnostics and treatments to those in needs in a timely manner. So this framework, um, is what has been developed for influenza at the moment. And just very quickly, I wanted to uh, acknowledge the, the, EVA, uh, uh, the EVA network, sorry. Um, we have 27 partners from Europe and nine from uh, other non-EU countries and we have associated partners. And we have all worked together for 10 years and we are actively sharing uh, our biological resources and uh, related to viruses. I think that's it for me. Wow, Christine, thank you so much for that presentation. Really, I think we are really impressed no, with the work that uh, you and your institution has been doing during the last uh, months. And of course, in the current context, is undeniable the role that the biobanks are playing. No? Um, and I think it's extremely important to highlight that in, in ABS, uh, we have a deficit uh, in, connected, uh, in connecting properly with the health uh, sector, no? Uh, and to understand better what are their needs and, and how it should work, no? Uh, of course, you mentioned right at the end, the PIP uh, framework, no? As a specific instrument uh, from the World Health Organization. And the problem is we know the limitations, no? that the scope is uh, very limited. So um, the problem, we have seen the first part of the current situation and still have to go through the second part, which is to have the vaccine and other uh, remedies, no? uh, other uh, pharmaceutical products that yeah. can help to deal with the, with the, with the pandemic. Uh, and we don't know if we are going to have benefit sharing as it has been the case with your uh, tests, no? So we, we still have some big question marks uh, remaining. No, but impressive. Uh, congratulations for the work that you have been uh, doing during the last uh, months. 
and keep going is, is the only thing we, we can say. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, before moving into Q&A, I would like to give the floor to Taokondo, back to you, because we have started this dialogue with the different uh, colleagues and with the researchers. Um, but as mentioned at the very beginning of the session, the intention was not to solve everything in this uh, session, but to initiate a dialogue and that the dialogue can be continued actually at the national level. So competent national authorities, governments meet with the researchers at the national or regional level to discuss and to prepare properly for the post 2020 biodiversity negotiations. So Taokondo, from the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, what opportunities are going to have researchers and governments to impact the post 2020 uh, global biodiversity uh, negotiations in the context of uh, DSI? And uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you once more, Leandro. Uh, it's been very exciting to listen to all the interesting presentations. And on DSI, as was said, uh, there are uh, divergent views on the issues and these one could put into three categories. And the first one being, does genetic resources in the CBD cover DSI or not? And the next one will be whether DSA should fall under the ABS regime or the NOGA protocol. And the third one being whether open access to DSI can be regarded as a sufficient form of benefit sharing. Now, as we move forward, uh, various options and scenarios are being considered and discussed to address the above issues based on the interest and positions of the various stakeholders. Uh, you have in front of you on the slide a, a roadmap towards uh, COP15, I see it just disappeared. Um, and uh, so this roadmap is uh, showing that we started off in February, June 2019 to receive submission of views um, from the various stakeholders regarding DSI. And then there was the peer reviewed studies, uh, four of them in October, December 2019. And in March this year, we had the RTEC on DSI. Uh, the outcomes of the RTEC will be considered uh, in preparation of the post-2020 global policy framework. Uh, somewhere in January, the date has to be determined for the Open Networking Group uh, 3. And then uh, we will have also the Substar SBI, it was envisaged for December, uh, but we're not, it's not yet determined. Um, then we will move on to have uh, um, the, the recommendations from the working group uh, on how to address DSI on post-2020 global framework in the COP. Uh, that would be somewhere in um, 2021 next year. Now, uh, the situation is that given the current global conditions of no virtual meetings uh, or, or of, of no physical meetings, uh, we had to decide to have to then use what is available and to continue the momentum to bring us together and to keep us on the same page. So uh, we have, uh, we are planning uh, information sharing webinars on DSI and Secretariat. The first one will be on 1st of December, 2020. And we have we are doing this with a couple of partners. And uh, so the first one will be understanding DSI. What are, the, what are the key concepts around DSI? What are the issues around DSI? And we bring that together with the ABS Questioning Development Initiative. And then on the 9th of December this year, we will have a look at DSI and the CBD. We will, uh, we will take a look at the outcomes of the RTEC and uh, deliberate a bit on that. And we then plan to have in uh, 
January or somewhere in 2021, uh, the policy options for ABS. So what are and, and DSI? What are the what are the issues and the divergence and convergence that is coming out of all the discussions? Uh, today we had this session. What has come out, and there will be many more other sessions coming up, and that will then give us an idea on on how to understand DSI and what we should know about uh, DSI, so that we can then start to talk to each other and not talk past each other. So the issue is uh, to elucidate and the core issues and bring us on the same page and to keep momentum on the issues as we move towards the COP. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> um for showing the the, the possible the incoming meetings that will uh, allow for the interaction uh for different uh, stakeholders for researchers for governments with um a still high level of uncertainty you know with uh, in regard to physical meetings for next year no uh, so the online meetings are uh, clear uh, taking place in next month uh, as you indicated um, and the other ones, we will need more time to, to be sure whether they will take place or they will need to be reprogrammed. Thank you so much uh, to you, Taokondo, and thank you also to all the panelists because they have been um, very actively engaged in answering some of the questions that have been uh, asked during the session. But we still have some minutes for uh, some questions, and I would like to um, take some questions that we have for the colleagues in India for both, for Dr. Bara Prasad and Dr. Mathur. Um, we have a question uh, uh, that says, how long is the average process in India between the initial file demand and the access permit? Um, and whether will online process speed up uh, this uh, process? And I would like to also um, add another question for India on how the benefits are shared with the communities or the providers of those uh, bioresources in India, no? So I don't know who wants to start, whether Dr. Mathur or Dr. Baraprasad. Yeah, Dr. Mathur, please. Yeah, please. Okay, see uh, what You have to release my video. I think you can activate your camera directly, Dr. Mathur, at the bottom of your screen. It, no, it says host has stopped it. Anyway, okay. Okay. Okay, okay. I hope, my, yes, you are, you are activated now. Thank you. See, there, there, are, there are several points uh, uh, in your question. Uh, the speaker has asked, I would say that undoubtedly the online portal is going to bring down the time frame drastically. Definitely, we have worked out. But I must also explain to you that uh, why do we need to take that much time? And believe me, I'll be candid enough. I am myself understanding the process that why it takes so much of time. And the reason is A, the geographic size of the country and the democratic process that we have. Because uh, the conserver of the resource is spread out in different parts of the country. So we need to identify them, we need to reach out to them, and we need to ensure that no incorrect sharing takes place. So see, that is the reason why we refer every case that comes to us for either giving permission or sharing of benefit to the 30 state biodiversity boards, which are spread throughout the country. So they will, when any application comes to us, we will forward it to them. And these state boards will then go to the biodiversity management committees. And believe me, there are 2,75,000 of them spread across the country. So it is the responsibility of the biodiversity management committee to identify A, the correct beneficiary, and B, to ensure 
that the correct beneficiary also receives the benefit. But we are aware that whatever procedural time is required to be cut, we are cutting it. And in those amendments that I have mentioned to you, which we are doing for the law and for the rules and for the ABS guidelines, these timelines are now being brought drastically. So definitely it is there. Now, the other part of the question is that, uh, uh, how do we distribute the benefits and what happens to those benefits? So see, uh, we are now addressing three issues. First is how to enhance the ABS potential how to spread our net wide. And I have no hesitation in saying that not everyone is inclined to come under the ABS fold. People take time to understand the philosophy of access and benefit sharing. So we are trying to educate, to sensitize, to train these people that access and benefit sharing is no taxation. It is a means to carry forward the philosophy of conservation and to help in A, the conservation of the resource and B, the person or community involved in that gets a benefit out of that. So these kind of uh, complexities are there and we are trying to work out uh, our ways. And in this process, uh, what we have realized that learning materials, can play a major role. So we are now in the process of making small videos, two, three minute video to tell a top decision maker that what is this ABS about? And believe me, there are different kinds of understandings of the ABS process. So we are using the media of an audiovisual production under an existing GIZ project. We have made them. And now India as a big country has different languages. So I have got it made in English and Hindi, but it doesn't really work. I'm now getting it translated to all regional languages. So these are the kind of steps that we are bringing in to build capacity. And in the context of ABS, I would say, I will raise number one, the issue of capacity building is prime. And if we are able to uh, meet these uh, constraints, we will be in a much better position to do that. I will now leave it to Dr. Vara Prashad if he wants to come in and chip in and add to whatever I have said, please. Uh, no, sir, uh, it's uh, wonderfully covered. I think, uh, except only one point I would like to say, we have started, the communities got some money from the case study where I presented. At least the four communities from our institute got the money through SBB. Its process started and a very active, Dialogue is going on between the research institutes and NBA, and I think it will definitely uh, will improve uh, in a very short time. The revisions are also very practical revisions. The chairman is actually concerned that it should be practical. So the revision is also, once it comes into place, I think we'll be distributing much more to the communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Elendro. Thank you so much for covering that. Uh that uh, question in a very effective way. I would like to make a couple of comments and ask uh, two more questions. Once, first we have a comment uh, from uh, a colleague in, in Germany indicating that compliance is, uh, is, is very challenging for researchers uh, and capacity building is key. This was mentioned no, already by uh, some of the panelists. And um, this person is highlighting that there is a new help desk for academic researchers in Germany, uh, the German uh, Nagoya Protocol Hub. The purpose is to help the German research community with understanding uh, their obligations, okay? And they are providing some information. Definitely this kind of uh, support uh, is necessary. Awareness is crucial and capacity building on researchers on, on this, uh, how to comply with ABS is also important. Um, we have a question from Elpidio Peria to Mary. I, I'm not sure if Mary is still connected. I hope so. Yes, Mary is connected. 
And the question, if I understand it correctly, I think he is asking about um, if there is a specific process in the EU regulation for um, competent authorities from third countries to contact the EU member states in order to help them to track or monitor their genetic resources. So um, we know the Nagoya Protocol um, establishes under Article uh, 15 and, and um, 16 this collaboration between national authorities. And I believe uh, LPD is asking whether there is a specific uh, channel to do that uh, under the EU regulation. Mary. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Thanks for that question, and thanks also for the uh, uh, last uh, uh, panel's presentations. They were super, super interesting, and I think very useful for all of us. <laughs> um, so to come to the question, uh, well, there's not a specific mechanism of communication established under the UABS regulation between competent authorities in third countries and competent authorities in the EU. But of course, well, we have provisions that ask the, the, the competent authorities in, um, in member states, in EU member states, to collaborate to, uh, and, and to uh, establish contacts with the competent authorities in, uh, in third countries. But you know, this is a, 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 an obligation, I would say, a recommendation maybe, under the Nagoya Protocol. So there's, uh, I mean, the, the, the competent authorities of um, provided countries or third countries can uh, uh, freely contact the competent authorities in, uh, in uh, member states and uh, establish an exchange of information directly with, uh, with them. Actually, we really encourage our member states to do so to establish direct contacts with the competent authorities in, uh, in uh, uh, third countries. Um, you can easily find the list of, our competent, of the competent authorities in the European Union on our Europa website. I can look for it and, and share it in the, in the chat if you want. So this might help to establish the direct contacts. Uh, maybe another thing, maybe one last thing. In case of... Uh, um, uh, information that cannot be made uh, public onto the ABS clearinghouse, the competent authorities in the EU, they can still use our uh, 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 platform to collect the information and transfer this privately to the competent authorities of the third country. I hope I answered the question. Um, we have a um... Um, very recent reaction, a question to the Indian uh, representatives. What would be your response to the current publication in science that the strict biodiversity laws are even preventing the national researchers from sharing new microbes with the world? Well, Dr. can I respond? Please, certainly. Yes, I, we too have read that paper. We are aware of some of the concerns which are there. But let me tell you that we are in the process of revamping the permissions and the approvals required. The scientific community has to be a little more patient, has to be a little more uh, comprehensive in their understanding. And we are now working out that what is the best way forward. In no way, the government, the ministry, or the NBA is trying to withhold any research activity for that matter. So it is a matter of time, and no new law has been enforced since we made this act in 2002. The only thing which is we are now doing based on the experience, how do we A, simplify the procedures? How do we make the playing field level? So it is, as I said, the process is on. We are listening to a range of scientists and the molecular scientists in particular to understand that how best we can simplify that. 
and in a democratic process the views of a majority has to be understood and then only a decision making is arrived at i want to assure you that we are right now undertaking this process and in a very short while from now we would be coming to a process that is more conducive for conducting research and certainly publications we also are trying to distinguish between what could be uh, a scientific activity leading to a publication and what could be a commercial activity leading to patents and things like that so we are trying to make this distinction and i am hopeful that in a few months from now we should be able to do that and we will come back with a rejoinder to this paper once we have taken and put our own house in a better shape thank you alejandro yes, could i say something very quickly on that as a microbiological um resource center here at the dsmz please somber I, I want to say how happy that makes me to hear you say that. That's really encouraging because we've received news, for example, the journal that is the official journal of record to describe new bacterial species recently told us they are no longer accepting new bacteria species descriptions from India. And when I hear that, it, it makes my heart break. You know, this is for these, this is how we describe new biodiversity. And I'm just encouraged to know that it's on your radar and, and that it's something you're committed to. So thank you for your partnership. You read my mind, Amber. I was going to... Let, let, let Sorry, me come, Dr. come back again. Uh, Alejandro, we need to go back to the repositories also. See, they have also to understand because the, their own law says that subject to national legislation. So we need that's what i said that we are now looking at our national legislation and see that how we can harmonize how we can make it more conducive and make it a level playing field so that every scientist within india and abroad is able to publish and submit uh, his samples uh, wherever and whatever repository they would like to do that and mind you that this problem is not with respect to all repositories there are repositories who are accepting that. So we need to, as I said, look at threadbare. And I'm confident that with our intent to make it uh, absolutely conducive for research, we will find an effective solution soon. Thank you. Very encouraging. I was going to echo just what you, Amber, was uh, saying. I think it's fantastic that a country uh, that is leading ABS uh, at the international uh, national level uh, is taking these steps now. And I think um, your role as chairman, your availability and participation in this kind of events uh, clearly shows your leadership and the direction that you are uh, clearly taking, no? which I, again, I think is, is very encouraging. No? And I believe that connects your last point with um, the final reflection that I would like to uh, bring to, to our attention from, from the questions and answers that we have in the chat. Um, and there is a, a general question to all the panelists. How can ABS and CBD instrument ensure that all of the Nagoya Protocol parties support the non-commercial researchers as mandated in Article 8A? Um, I think you made that point, Dr. Mathur, just at the end. Um, one of the positive things, but also showing some shortcomings, is that the Nagoya Protocol is extremely flexible. So um, one of the key challenges is to harmonize or to standardize to a certain extent, no? for users, some of those practices and some of those national laws. No? I don't think we can um, ensure that because it depends on how you introduce that at the national level, but definitely uh, this requires a certain level of uh, standardization no? in order to ensure that non-commercial research is facilitated at the national level no? through all these 
uh, access procedures. I don't know if any of the panelists want to add something on this uh, final point. Uh, Alejandro, may I? Please, Mary, definitely. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to switch on my camera. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I actually had raised uh, my my hand even before, but I think you 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 read into my mind because I was going to make a comment on those lines, uh, and I think this is a very uh, valid point that is raised and listening also to the discussions that we we have had today and also to the several comments that we received uh, in our experience from the research communi community i wonder if a way to address the, the necessity to have uh, speditive access for emergencies or also uh, um, more simple procedures in the case of research, so non-commercial utilizations, could be the development of standardized model contractual uh, clauses. Because this is something that we have seen is an option under the Nagoya protocol, but we don't see many of these standardized uh, model contractual clauses being used, at least in our, in, in our practice. And this probably could be helpful. Of course, this requires maybe some uh, efforts from the countries who decide to legislate on access and, and also involvement from the uh, side of the stakeholders that can provide uh, uh, insights on how the practice work and this could be helpful to develop this standardized model that could be used worldwide and could perhaps facilitate uh, uh, the, the, as well compliance with these, uh, with these standards. And for, for the, uh, the, the case of uh, um, health emergencies i think you you raised a very good point before when you mentioned the fact that to some extent we have a, def a deficit in connecting with the with the health sector uh, and probably here yeah, an important role could be played by specialized instrument and, and maybe who uh, which is an important player i think for for, for this sector could uh, 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 could play an important role uh, so I just wanted to show this. Thank you, Mary, for those uh, final reflections. Colleagues, we have been for three hours already. I think this is a moment to conclude. I would like to thank, first of all, the interpreter for uh, the interpreters for their support. Uh, this session um, was also made available in uh, Russian, which is I think very important for that uh, region. Um, I would like to definitely uh, thank the, the panelists, in particular the ones from the Pacific, as it's midnight already there in that uh, region. So thank you so much for uh, staying with us until the end of the session. And of course, I would like to thank uh, the, the, the colleagues, the team of the Secretariat of the Convention of Biological Diversity and the colleagues, the team of the UNDP Jeff Global Avias Project for making possible this uh, session. Um, please follow us, don't uh, join us also for the incoming uh, sessions. Very quickly to remind you next Wednesday, we will have a dialogue between uh, governments and private sector. This is very connected with research. So it would be nice if researchers would also follow what the private sector has to say in regard to the current implementation of ABS. The following week, on the 18th of November, we will have uh, the same uh, approach, a dialogue between governments, national competent authorities, and uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. And the final session will take place on Wednesday, 25th of November. We will wrap up, summarize all the discussions, and we'd like to hear from uh, donors, uh, international institutions, organizations that are implementing uh, these kind of projects uh, to see what is uh, happening and what is going to uh, take place in the post-2020 negotiations. That's all from our side. Please uh, continue to join us uh, for the other sessions of the conference and have a great day.